I would be more than happy to write to the member uh, detailing them uh, so that he is fully aware of their detail. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we will now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12395 in the name of Murdo Fraser on an energy strategy for Scotland. I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to and move the motion. Ten minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, we had yet more unwelcome news about the future of the Longanet power station in Fife. As someone who represents the area, I am well aware of the significance of the plant to the local economy, and it was only a few months ago that I made my most recent visit there. In all the press speculation about the plant's future, one of our primary concerns should be for the workforce who are undoubtedly facing a worrying time. The issue which was highlighted last week in relation to the future of Longanet was that of transmission charging, although there is nothing new about this. Last week I spoke to both Scottish Power and National Grid on this issue, and I sincerely hope that a resolution can be found. Ofgem have recently approved a significant change to substantially reduce future generation charges in Scotland, particularly for a plant like Longanet, which generally tends to run when the wind is not blowing, and these are planned to be introduced from April next year but we should be going further. And while the transmission charging issue is a serious one, we should not pretend that it is by any means the only threat to Longanet's future. New EU emissions rules and the introduction of carbon pricing mean that the future of Longanet after 2020 is at best very uncertain. So resolving the transmission charging issue is likely to buy at best a stay of execution. And this is a serious matter, and not just for those whose jobs are dependent upon the power station. For Longanet today provides some 20% of Scotland's electricity output. It has been as high as 25% in the recent past. It is also, of course, a major buyer of coal from Scottish open cast producers, and therefore its possible closure has a wider impact in terms of the Scottish economy. What makes the current situation even more worrying is that Longanet is not the only power station facing closure. Scotland's three biggest generating stations today are Longanet, Torness and Hunterston, the last two being, of course, nuclear powered, and both of them scheduled to close by 2025. And between the three, they currently produce 55% of Scotland's electricity. Now, we know that the Scottish Government has something of an obsession with renewable energy. But the Scottish Conservatives believe that renewable energy has a part to play as a component in the energy mix, but we do not share the Scottish Government's single-minded obsession with renewable energy, particularly wind power, to the exclusion of all other technologies. And the simple fact is that intermittent energy sources cannot provide the baseload that is necessary to provide electricity to Scotland's homes and businesses at all times to meet every demand, whether or not the wind is blowing. I'll give way to the Minister. Minister Fergus Ewing. Does Murdo Fraser recognise that I have made it clear for the last four years, uh, and also I have made it clear specifically in our electricity generation policy statement of 2013, that we recognise that we will continue to need a minimum of 2.5 gigawatts of conventional thermal delivered electricity. And that has been our position for as long as I've been the Minister, despite constant misrepresentation. Murdo Fraser? Well, if that is the Minister's position, he is not convincing anyone involved in the industry. Just last week, Professor Paul Younger, the Professor of Energy Engineering at Glasgow University, a man we might expect, Deputy Presiding Officer, to know a little bit about this subject, said, and I quote, we are already getting to where it is getting too late to design, build and commission new power stations, especially when you have got the Scottish Government making common cause with the anti-everything brigade. Now, those are the views of Professor Younger. You would think, as the Professor of Energy Engineering, the Scottish Government might be listening to his view. But what we have is the Scottish Government putting all its eggs in the basket of intermittent wind power. It has slammed the door shut on fracking and the potential for unconventional gas, and it refuses to consent to any new nuclear plants. So within a decade, we're going to lose 55% of 
of our electricity generating capacity, and there is simply no strategy from the SNP government as to how we're going to keep the lights on after 2025. Now, Professor Younger again got it right last week when he said this. It doesn't help when last week we have got the Scottish Government cheerleading against fossil fuels, and then this week saying, oh, hang on a minute, we desperately need them. Well, let's get consistent, guys. The Minister may think he's got a consistent position, but it's certainly not reflected in the statements from some of his colleagues. I think we need a clear statement from the Scottish Government on what exactly is their energy strategy for the next decade. Now, to be fair to the Minister, he can, on occasion, approach these issues with a degree of good sense. Unfortunately, his amendment today resorts to the tired old tactic of blaming everything on Westminster. The government amendment doesn't give the full picture, even in relation to Longanit. It doesn't mention the issues of EU emissions targets or of carbon pricing, both of which the SNP are fully signed up to in government. And even in relation to the transmission charging issue, it misses the point. Because the transmission charging regime affects all generating plant in Scotland and has been in existence for many years. Exactly the same transmission regime, which applies to Longanet, applies to Scottish Power's other generating asset, the White Lees Wind Farm, sitting on more or less precisely the same latitude as Longanet, but does not threaten that project's viability. Indeed, on a daily basis, we see applications flooding in for wind farms all over Scotland, subject to exactly the same transmission charging regime as affects conventional stations. So clearly transmission charging is a barrier, and one we need to try and overcome, but it's not an insurmountable one if you've got the right kind of project with the right technology. And the SNP amendment leaves us with another question. What exactly is the SNP policy for electricity generation? Is it to rely wholly on renewables? Now, the Minister is fond of saying that in energy, variety is everything. But there are no concrete proposals brought forward to replace either our existing nuclear capacity or conventional generation. And while the SNP may not like nuclear power, the fact is this is a low carbon green energy which we are going to need if we want to meet our climate change targets and keep the light on at the same time. Yep. Yes, Mr Brodie. Mr Brodie. Um, I have here a letter uh, which you've heard me say before is a dear chick from Nick, the letter which talks about the coalition's objectives on new nuclear st uh, uh, stations, that they can go ahead so long as it is without subsidy. How do you explain the £35 million pounds plus that is about to be spent on Hinkley Point, largely through subsidy from the government? The, the, the reality is all sources of energy require some level of subsidy. That's the regime we have under contracts for difference. However, Mr Brody needs to bear in mind, new nuclear power is cheaper than every form of renewable technology, including onshore wind, and the SNP benches should bear that in mind. No, I, I need to make some progress, Mr Harvey. Now, the Minister mentions in his amendment the need for increased investment in large-scale, flexible electricity storage solutions, including pumped storage. He's right to say that if we are relying on intermittent sources of energy, we need more storage. But how much? Does the government know? I've seen an assessment this week that says we would need 20 large-scale pump storage schemes. Does the minister agree with that? If it's not 20, how many is it? Where would these be built? What would the cost be? They would cost billions of capital expenditure to create. What would the impact on electricity bills be from those projects? Does the minister have any answer to these questions, or is he simply making it up as he goes along? We will hear from him shortly. Let me turn briefly to the other amendments. Lewis Macdonald's amendment, uh, although the tone of it, uh, much of the tone of it I agreed with, it unfortunately deletes reference to the closure of both Hunterston and Torness, which makes it difficult for us to support. And I see that Labour's uh, famous resilience fund is getting yet another run out, <laughs> and I wonder how many times over that particular pocket of money has been spent. The kindest thing I can say about Patrick Harvey's amendment is that after yesterday's campaign launch, it is good to know that at least one person in the Green Party can finish a sentence. As to, the, as to the substance, it is the stuff of fantasy. I don't know anyone with a professional involvement in power generation who believes we can rely wholly on renewables for our energy supply. Even the industry trade body, Scottish Renewables, don't make that claim. Presiding officer, over the past decade, we have heard a lot from the SNP and from the former First Minister about how Scotland is to be the Saudi Arabia of renewables 
how we are an oil-rich, energy-rich nation. What an irony it would be, therefore, if the only way we could keep the lights on in Scotland would be to import power from England. And yet that is exactly where we are heading. And don't take my word for it, because that is what Professor Younger said last week, and I quote, we will be reliant on importing power from England for about 25% of Scottish demand. We need at least one new gas-powered generating station for Scotland. And if we are not going to replace Torness and Hunterston with new nuclear capacity, probably more than one. I would like to make a bid today for a new gas station to be located at Longanet in Fife. The infrastructure is there, the skills are there, and the workforce is there. If Longanet, the existing station, is having to close, and sadly that looks inevitable, whatever happens to transmission charging, then let's see a replacement in that corner of Fife. But that needs to be part of a broader energy strategy, and that is what is currently lacking. Let me close by quoting again from Professor Younger. Talking of the Scottish Government's approach, he said, we need to be consistent here and have a bit of leadership. I agree entirely with that. We need an updated energy strategy for Scotland, and we need that urgently before the lights go out. I have pleasure in moving the motion in my name. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Many thanks. Now Colin Fergus Ewing to speak to and move Amendment 12395.1. Minister, up to seven minutes, please, tight for time today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I welcome the opportunity to debate this important matter. I genuinely do, and I thank Murdo Fraser and his party for raising it in this chamber. There are a few things of more immediate importance than the future of uh, Gannett, because that future is under imminent threat. Like Mr. Fraser, I've uh, visited Longanet on more than one occasion, and I did so most recently on Monday, and I pay tribute to the professionalism of the staff there. The station was built for 25 years for an intended life of 150,000 running hours. It has delivered electricity for this country for 42 years, over 215,000 hours. And I was informed by the manager of Longanet uh, that last year was its best operational year ever. I think that says a lot for the professionalism uh, of those who have worked there over four decades, many of whom have served for most of that period, and also uh, for the company that has invested, I believe, of the order of £200 million uh, towards meeting the challenges, such as the uh, emissions of uh, uh, sulphur dioxide uh, and other gases, in order to address the environmental concerns quite rightly. So I think, you know, to, to find some consensus to start off in this debate, I, I feel that there is a broad consensus that in Scotland, uh, Longanet has served us well, that we continue to need it now, that it faces a challenging future beyond 2020, but that broadly speaking, setting political disagreements aside, we all want to see a solution that will allow Longanet to continue to operate for several years to come. Now, presiding officer, I think the record will show that I have been pretty consistent in arguing as energy minister that in order to meet our needs of security of supply, of reasonable cost, of reliability, uh, that we need a balance to our electricity mix. I've argued that time and time again, but I haven't just argued it here in this chamber in speeches. Uh, I have uh, uh, ensured that it has been set out in a policy document in 2013, namely the Electricity Generation Policy Statement. That was a document prepared by technical experts, and I am not one of those, neither I suspect are many other members in this chamber, but it was prepared on expert advice, and that is our policy statement. Now, the fact that various people who write for tabloid newspapers or who other operate in communicating what they purport to be news to the outside world doesn't detract from the fact that A, we have been entirely consistent in calling for a balanced uh, uh, means of supply of our electricity system, and B, we have set it out furthermore clearly in writing and in great technical detail. Happy to, to take it. But take it. In, in, in denigrating all those who disagree with his stance, does the Minister include in those Professor Paul Younger, Professor of en Energy Engineering at Glasgow University, why does he not buy into the Minister's vision that he's just set out? 
Mr. Well, there's three questions there. I'm not going to be drawn into making comments on particular individuals, but, uh, but uh, if, if Mr. Fraser can demonstrate to me and provide me with anything that I have said that's contradicted what I've just said now, I will be very interested to hear it, because it doesn't exist. Now, let me make, make, some, make some progress, because I only have seven minutes, and I want to get to the meat of the issue here. Uh, and first of all, I, I have to point out gently to Murdo Fraser that there are a couple of difficulties with the motion, uh, which is sa sadly factually wrong. The motion which he has put down for Parliament says, and I quote, that urges Scottish power and national grid to work toward a resolution of the transmission charging issue. Signing officer, Scottish power and national grid are not working towards a resolution of the char transmission charging issue. The new grid contract which Scottish Power seek as a resolution is not a resolution of the transmission charging problem. It is simply a very limited stopgap measure under the supplementary balancing reserve in order to, to enable Hoganet to continue to operate because, but it only partially addresses the symptoms of a much deeper problem, i.e. the discriminatory grid charges. Now, let me just introduce these facts. The, the grid charges for Peterhead, £22.97 per kilowatt. Longanet, £18.02. Hunterston, 16 Turness, 14 Eggborough in Yorkshire, £7.61. Didcot, Yorkshire, they get paid 83p. Taylor's Lane, London, they get paid £3.78. Now, I read that out because that, presiding officer, is the evidence. What does that mean? It means that the extra costs, in addition to, of course, the problems which I accept, uh, or, or the, the legal obligations which I accept exist in respect of industrial emissions and carbon duties, these affect all stations. But you see, the problem is for Longanet. They have to pay £40 million pounds extra on top of that. I haven't got time, sorry Mr Harvey, maybe in closing. So, to develop the argument, the central conundrum for the Scottish Conservatives presiding officer is this. We agree that we need more conventional thermal generation in Scotland. Indeed, I consented a one gigawatt of new gas generation for Kikensi. We agree that. I've made that clear uh, ad infinitum. But the trouble is, no one is going to build it because it makes no economic sense. No, no one is going to build new conventional stations. So the great irony here today, presiding officer, is the Tories are calling for something which is economically impossible because no one is going to do it. And unless the transmission charging discrimination is addressed in the long term, uh, then that is a problem uh, which is crystal clear and at which the Scottish Conservatives, with sadly a motion which is flawed, uh, uh, have not brought forward any solution whatsoever. Many thanks. And I now call on Lewis MacDonald to speak to and move Amendment 12395.3. Mr MacDonald, you have up to five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Indeed, Longanet Power Station is under threat of closure, and that is indeed a matter of regret. But it should come as no surprise to anyone, and least of all to ministers in the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government's report on proposals and policies, which is supposed to show how ministers intend to meet binding carbon emission targets agreed by Parliament, makes the assumption that Longanet will be closed by 2020. It is acknowledged to be a seriously polluting plant by European standards. European Union requirements on carbon emissions mean that it cannot survive in its current form without very substantial additional investment. That investment has not yet been forthcoming. Scottish Power has not invested to date, and the company's decision not to bid into the capacity market auction from 2018-19 gives a pretty clear indication of its intentions. The best recent hope for Longanet in the medium term was a scheme to enable investment in carbon capture and storage. That scheme did not reach fruition, in part because Scottish Power deemed the billion pounds of public money on offer, potentially on offer, not to be enough. And once that decision was taken, the die was cast 
and the chances of lung gannet surviving into the 2020s in its current form effectively came to an end. So I think the Scottish Government's responsibility in this situation is to be open and honest with the communities of West Fife about the power station's future prospects. Yet today's SNP amendment fails to address the prospect of closure, be it in 2018, in 2020 or beyond. Instead, Mr Ewing asserts uh, that cleaner thermal, and I quote, cleaner thermal generation progressively fitted with carbon capture and storage technology will continue to play an important role, as if such cleaner thermal generation already played a part. Of course, it does not, and it may not for some time. Although the technology certainly exists, it does not yet operate at scale and has some proving to do before it can do so. Of course. Thank, thank you to Lewis McDonald for giving way. Does he accept that, in fact, of course, we're seeing CCS schemes uh, agreed to go ahead at Peterhead in respect of gas CCS and in respect of coal and white roads south of the border, something which I, I thought we all welcomed? Lewis indeed, indeed I, I'm sure we all do welcome. And, and I heard a good deal about the Peterhead uh, gas CCS project last night at the Shell Springboard events here in Edinburgh, and it's a, a very exciting prospect. I wish it well. I hope it can prove the commercial feasibility of gas carbon capture, and I hope White Rose can do the same for coal. But uh, these projects are both at a very early stage uh, in proving uh, their effectiveness, uh, and therefore it would be a mistake to make assumptions uh, about either of them. And neither of these projects bears directly on the position at Long Granite. The Government amendment also refers to its electricity generation policy statement, which indeed the Minister was quoted when he was interviewed about the position at Long Gannett on Radio Scotland last week, and he quoted again today. And it, that statement of Government policy envisages, and I quote, the scheduled closure of existing plants, and, as he has also said, the construction of a minimum of 2.5 gigawatts of new or replacement efficient fossil fuel electricity generation progressively fitted with CCS. Now, progressively fitted with CCS is a, a, a very interesting phrase. It appears to mean, possibly, building a new coal or gas-fired power station in Scotland in the 2020s, in the hope that it can then be retrofitted successfully with carbon capture technology after the event. I hope that uh, would prove to be the case. But there are many problems with that basic proposition in the government's position. There is an obvious paradox between a legal obligation to seek to meet world-leading targets on carbon emissions and a policy choice to allow new coal-burning plant without CCS built in from the beginning. There is an equally obvious risk in basing an energy policy on the retrofitting of a new technology before that retrofitting, or indeed that technology, has been shown to work at the required scale. But most seriously, by appearing to imply that future energy needs can be met by burning coal, there is a real risk of the government misleading the workforce at Longanet about the real prospects for their existing jobs going forward. Now, hundreds of valuable jobs are provided directly at Longanet, hundreds more indirectly. The sudden loss of so many events, uh, so many jobs in the event of an early closure would hit the local economy hard, especially if the government and its agencies have not fully engaged with the local community in good time. This prospect again makes the case for a resilience fund open to local councils to bid for support in the face of a sudden economic shock, and that is something we call for again today. But there is a duty on ministers to engage in meaningful discussion with the local council and the local community about what happens when Longanet ceases to generate electricity from coal. That engagement needs to happen urgently, it needs to happen now, and it is on that basis that I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. Now, Colin Patrick Harvey, up to five minutes. Please move your amendment as well, please, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Mardo Fraser uh, indicated that he was uh, trying to find the kindest thing that he could to say about my amendment. Well, I appreciate the efforts he went to. I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge I could have survived without that particular kindness uh, this week. But uh, let me repay the, the, the compliment, because there is at least um, something that I can agree with in, in his opening remarks. He makes it clear that the government's position on placing the emphasis on recent developments regarding Long Gannett purely on the transmission charging regime, this is at best a partial description of, of current circumstances. And Mr Fraser's motion is quite right uh, to mention the EU emission rules and carbon pricing. The, the transmission regime is clearly a factor, and I I'd happily acknowledge that I'd go as far 
uh, in, in the minister's direction as that. But it's not a new factor. It's a long-standing one, and I find it hard to rationalise a position which places the heavy emphasis that he does on that long-standing factor on recent uh, events. Minister. Uh, I mean, on the face of it, that's a fair point, but Mr Harvey will recollect quite well that, that this party has campaigned and in government has campaigned for Project Transmit. The First Minister, Mike Weir, back in 2005, uh, and Project Transmit was supposed to have delivered a significantly improved position, reducing the price discrimination. But that process has been delayed to 216, and by, by judicial review, potentially to beyond that. Harvey. I, I, I hope the point, the general point, is made that this is one factor amongst many, and that the minister uh, has failed to place uh, sufficient emphasis or recognition. Uh, on the issues of emission rules and carbon pricing. I have to say, Mr Fraser's motion as well gives a, a partial emphasis on some aspects. He, he says in the, the third line uh, that Longanic contributes 25% of Scotland's electricity output at its peak. It's not enough in considering these questions only to look at electricity output. We also have to acknowledge that Longanit is by far and away the biggest contributor to climate change in Scotland, the biggest contributor to carbon emissions which are driving climate change, one of the most crucial threats that our, our civilization faces in the 21st century. And it's a partial description of things only to look at the electricity output and not uh, at that factor. I think the, the, the Minister's uh, amendment uh, also, Lewis MacDonald's, uh, I'm sorry, I have to move on. M Lewis MacDonald's uh, emphasis on the, the, the slight ambiguity around the wording uh, in relation to CCS. Lewis MacDonald is quite right on that point. The, the, the suggestion that this will continue to play a role uh, clearly seems to imply the suggestion that it currently does play a significant role, which it doesn't, uh, as well as the, the, the use of the word progressively, which, uh, as Mr. MacDonald uh, rightly identified, seems to lay open the possibility that additional fossil fuel generating capacity will be approved without the, uh, the existing, uh, without CCS being an existing element. And I would refer members to the, to the WWF briefing for the debate, where they acknowledge their, their support for research into CCS. And I've never myself been against research uh, into CCS, including public support for, for that research. But it makes clear uh, that the commercialisation of CCS has not yet been happening at pace. The Scottish Government, they say, has a responsibility to plan and cater for a scenario in which CCS does not establish itself as quickly as might previously have been hoped. Uh, and they call on the Scottish Government to review its energy generating, uh, generation policy statement accordingly. I think that's a, an important uh, point uh, to make as well as that being consistent with the long-standing expectation, uh, as mentioned, I think, in RPP2, uh, that the Scottish Government has long, had a long-standing uh, assumption that Longanet may close by 2020. Let's acknowledge as well that that transition we are in needs to be a just transition. And there needs to be a far greater emphasis, I would say from both levels of government, uh, on the diversification of local economies which are currently heavily dependent on forms of industry, in, in this please. case, forms of energy generation, which are short-term, which are not going to have a long-term future. Mr Macdonald's uh, amendment says that the Scottish Government has responsibility for stewardship of the Scottish economy. Would that that were so? Uh, responsibility is clearly divided between two governments, and it's not enough to say that one government has responsibility without having the power. But these, these wider issues about the just transition are echoed in the final part uh, of the Green Amendment, uh, and I commend that amendment to the Chamber, and I move it. Thank Many thanks. Up, and we now move to open debate. Very tight for time, as I said. Up to four minutes speeches, please. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Cara Hilton. Th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. So I've got a lot to get through in these four minutes, so let's crack on. Uh, in terms of Long Gannett, um, I, I hear the comments that are being made that transmission charging is only a part uh, of, of what is being uh, what is affecting the station, but it's a £40 million pound part of what is affecting the station. If we look at uh, press release issued by Pro the Prospect Union, 
it says the union representing engineers, technicians and other professional staff in the electricity supply industry has warned the viability of Scottish Power Run Long Gannet, Scotland's largest power station, is threatened by a £40 million charge for connecting it to the grid, which penalises it in comparison to similar energy generation south of the border. A like with like comparison. And indeed, uh, Prospect's National Secretary says we welcome the Minister, Fergus Ewing's commitment to continue to put pressure on the Westminster Government, who have responsibility for this matter. So the Union are identifying the transmission charging as the key element uh, in terms of the Long Gannet situation. Uh, I only have four minutes, Mr Fraser, and I have a lot that I need to get through. Uh, in terms uh, further of uh, transmission charging, we also should accept that Contrary to uh, Murdo Fraser's uh, statements, that it also does impact on the renewable ind industry as well. Scottish Renewables, in their briefing provided to members, say levying higher charges on generators using the transmission network located furthest away from the main centre of demands can present a barrier to renewable energy generators, which must locate where the resource is strongest often far from the main centres of demand. Renewable energy, in terms of its location, is not as flexible uh, as perhaps other forms of energy generation might be because of the requirements uh, of the resource from which, they will, uh, from which they will deliver the energy and deliver the, the, the electricity into the grid. And it's also worth noting that in terms of Murdo Fraser's call for a new gas station on the site of Long Gannet, without the resolution uh, of the transmission charging regime, irrespective of the merits or otherwise of the proposal. If those transmission charges are not addressed, then any future station, as Murdo Fraser envisages it, will simply find itself affected by the same transmission charging problems and the same economic barriers as Longana is currently facing. So that is the key in all of this, is to address the discriminatory transmission charging regime, which sees, as the Minister highlighted, uh, projects in the south of England being subsidised for connection and projects in Scotland paying through the nose in order to make the connection. And I have to say that I, I'm becoming a little bit concerned that the Scottish Conservatives are uh, becoming overly obsessed with wind energy to the point of it being detrimental to them. Uh, I note, however, that they don't mind wind farms as long as they are perhaps the beneficiaries uh, as a consequence uh, of the income of those. But I do think it is a little bit perverse that at the same time as the Tories seem to object to people being able to see a turbine from their window, they seem pretty gung-ho about having that same property drilled under uh, as part of uh, fracking and hydraulic uh, exploration. And I think the position that the Minister has taken in terms of a moratorium to address the uh, clear questions that need to be answered is a sensible one uh, and certainly I uh, wouldn't wish him to be going down the same gung-ho route that Murdo Fraser and his colleagues seem to wish to go down I on this. To a close, in please. terms of security of supply, presiding officer, it's worth noting that despite the Tories' obsession with wind, there are other renewable options out there. And indeed, an Aberdeen Grampian Chamber of Commerce briefing that's been provided shows that from their members, uh, wave and tidal is a significant area that they wish to see being developed in terms of future uh, demand. But also, it is worth noting that the British Chambers of Commerce have said that they want to see Must a 50 year please. energy security strategy from the UK government. So I think it would be worthwhile to be calling for that before we're looking for an update to the very sensible energy strategy that the Scottish Government is pursuing. Thank you very much. Now I call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Chick Brody. Up to four minutes, please. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to take part in today's debate on an issue which is of huge importance to Fife and to Scotland. Uh, Long Island sits in the west side of my constituency, and many of the 260 employees are my constituents. Hundreds more are employed as contractors and subcontractors, and so many jobs locally in Concarden and West Fife are dependent on the plant having a future. As members are all well aware, Long Island has been generating electricity since 1970 and has the capacity to put around 2,000 megawatts into the national grid. And when I met with Long Island management and workers just a few months ago, they were confident that there could be a future for the plant to 2020 and indeed quite a few years beyond that. But the events in the past 10, years, 10 days appear to have cast doubt on this and there's now obviously renewed concerns about the security of supply and about the future of the workforce. And this is obviously no surprise when we consider that Long Island potentially keeps the lights on for more than 2 million homes and businesses. 
Now, I'm a supporter of renewable energy, and I do think we need to do more to promote renewable energy sources, just as we all need to do more to save energy if we've got any hope of meeting our climate change targets in Scotland. But we've also got to guarantee that when we flick on the light switch, that the lights come on. We need backup, and I don't think we can rely solely on an energy supply that depends on when the wind blows or when water flows. Around 25 per cent of the energy we consume is produced at Long Annet, and while we're hearing assurances that security of supply is not an issue, I think if we want to be self-sufficient in Scotland, does uh, the members um, and the SNP benches want to, uh, then clearly this is an issue. And right now, Scotland relies on imports of English electricity to meet demand for one in every si six days. Professor Younger, who has already been quoted by Murdo Fraser, has warned that Long Annet's closure would leave Scotland in serious trouble and we could be left absolutely dependent on England to keep the lights on. In respect of the talks between Scottish Power and the National Grid that had apparently broken down and that have sparked this debate, um, digging deeper it would seem, as the Minister has confirmed, that transmission charges are not part of these negotiations, and I think more is going to come out about this in the coming weeks. Um, we continue to hear conflict and accounts from all involved in these talks. And I really do think that this manoeuvring isn't helpful at all for the workforce or for the families at a time when all involved should be concentrating on working constructively to secure a sustainable solution. My constituents want to know that Scottish Power and the National Grid are round the table negotiating to find a solution that maximises the life of Long Annet and secures their jobs into the future. And what they, they want assurances too from the Scottish Government that they're doing all it, they can to find a solution that will support the local community in and around Concarton. And I'm pleased to to see the Minister nodding his head there, and also to plan and meet our energy needs now and in the future. Workers are worried about their jobs, their mortgages and their families, and they want to see action on this issue. The Scottish Government has long anticipated that Long Annet may have to close by 2020. Why is it then that so little action has been taken to secure new employment investment into the Concarden area to ease transition, to support the local community and to build its resilience? So on behalf of all those directly affected in my constituency, I would be grateful if rather trying to shift the blame onto Westminster and to others, that the Minister and the Scottish Government will set out what practical steps will be taken to protect the hundreds of jobs in my constituency, which depends on Long Annet, to prepare the local community should the worst happen and to keep the lights on across Scotland now and in the future. The Scottish Government needs a plan for the future of Long Anna and they need a plan now. Um, an important related energy matter which is of huge concern to my constituents in Concarden and surrounding villages on the 4th is UCG. And unfortunately, I am running out of time, but I hope that the Scottish Mark. Government will act too to extend the fracking moratorium to cover this extremely risky and potentially dangerous technique. As Friends of the Earth say in their excellent briefing for today's debate, two out of three is not good enough. UCG must be included in the moratorium too. My constituents close, in Concarden please. and West Fife want an assurance from the Scottish Government that there will be no fracking under the fourth and I hope the Minister will listen and take action. Many thanks. Now call on Chick Brody to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, obviously transmission charging is a big element of this debate but the first duty of a government's energy policy is a guarantee of secure uh, supply for businesses and consumers and to maintain that secure supply through reserve capacity. The UK Government are, are failing in this regard. The UK Government's white paper in 2011 said low capacity margins could trigger supply shortages costing the UK economy £600 million. The UK government failed in its handling of the electricity market reforms, which has, because of its shilly shallying, has led to delayed investment in new capacity and indeed the mothballing of some existing capacity. And yet only four months ago, at two meetings with some national grid managers, we were told that reserve energy capacity margins for this winter this winter would be as low as 4%. And when we then asked about next winter, the pearls of wisdom were that they didn't know, but they might seek to reopen mothballed gas fire stations down south or import energy uh, from abroad, abroad in the event of possible outages. They just don't know. This, this when we are talking of an imminent threat to the Long Annet power station. Nothing short of the National Grid and Ofgem senior officers coming to this Parliament to ex openly explain the basis of their analysis and their strategy is acceptable. And on top of the UK EMR's debacle uh, and the grid's apparent inability to clarify that strategy, we have the, the Tories, the Tories calling for a new energy strategy for Scotland after applauding the single UK energy market to which we uh, subscribed. And, yes, and today we're talking about a single European market. They hint at disappointment, again, of the removal 
of, of, of nuclear power stations as part of the energy mix. And, and I have to uh, say that Murdo Fraser misled the Chamber when he said it was cheaper. New nuclear is expensive. The strike price is £92.50 per megawatt hour, which is twice the current wholesale price, not cheaper. And we hear there... And we, no, I won't. I've got, I'm just about to finish. And we hear the newly point of order, Murdo Fraser. We hear the point new, of order, Murdo Fraser. We hear the Mr. newly Brody, adopted sit bleats. Down. The sit down, Mr. Brody. Thank, Thank you. you. Point, well, point of order, of order Murdo Fraser. Officer, when, when a member deliberately misrepresents and misquotes what another member said in the chamber, what steps can I take to have the record corrected? The member can, if he wishes correct the record for himself. It is not a point of order notwithstanding because Mr Brodie's remarks are a matter for him. I think I was Mr. making Brody. a point and I think the point stands, presiding officer. <laughs> and we hear their, uh, well, we, you're, you're, they're, they're bleats, the newly adopted bleats about the uh, possible reliance on Scotland importing energy from the rest of the UK. For goodness sake, Scotland exports and exported energy to the rest of the UK. That is why along at it, it must stay open not least of all because of the implication uh, also for jobs. That is why we must continue to encourage investment in a renewable energy mix of wind, tidal and solar. That is why we need a, a dedicated capacity assessment for Scotland, to which the, about which the First Minister uh, wrote to the Prime Minister, who apparently has refused to take a, any action. And that is why we will seek clarity on national goods numbers and on a policy that charges more for transmission, as has been made uh, clear earlier, at major uh, potential points of production, like the Western Isles, uh, Peterhead and Long Island, yet subsidises major please. consumer belts in the southeast of England. It's the economics of the madhouse. It is about transmission charges, presiding officer, but much more initially about policy around capacity, and we need answers on that and answers now. Thanks. I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thanks, President Officer. Uh, West Lothian in my region has for 200 years or more been at the centre of energy development oh, no. in Scotland. Um, Paraffin Young in the 1850s developed a refinery at Bathgate and shale mines served across the, uh, the West Lothian area. We had oil refineries, candle works, all uh, operating in West Lothian and new villages uh, emerging because of that industry. Uh, this was the world centre of the commercial oil industry at that time. And of course, we had the coal industry. Uh, pits littered the area, employing thousands of men in villages like Blackburn, West Calder, Armadale, uh, Breach, and Whitburn, and Polkemet being the last colliery uh, that we had. And at the, uh, today, we are at the centre of a new energy Klondike and onshore wind development, and with overseas speculators seeking to cash in on the rush to put up as many turbines as possible in the shortest space of time. We have Austrian, French, Spanish and Italian multinational corporations, venture capital firms and wealthy speculators looking to cash in from communities they have never visited and probably could, could not point to on a map. And this, for me, is the problem, President Officer. While shale and coal produced energy, it also produced other things. It produced jobs, thousands of jobs. It produced homes for families, some of them still standing to this day, community halls, miners' welfare social clubs. It prov provided services for pensioners, education facilities, gala days and the like, creating and developing communities. And while communities can and do get involved in community benefit negotiations with onshore wind energy developers, in the big scheme of things, the money and benefit received is crumbs from the table compared to the profits made by the speculators. So I'm pleased to see in the, the budget this year an increase uh, in the cash available for new the new local uh, energy innovation fund. But this needs to be driven. We need it driven by government. It needs an uh, enthusiastic, dynamic champion making this happen, banging the First Minister's table, demanding action. And I'm afraid to say I just don't see the Minister in that role. I have been for years calling for community development trusts, local authorities, NHS boards, schools and colleges to be allowed to run and develop renewable energy projects. We should see them retaining the profits 
in the communities that host the wind energy schemes. No, thank you. Uh, not exporting the profits to the corporate boardrooms across Europe. And we should see them investing in initiatives to address fuel poverty, cut heating bills for people and build new energy efficient social housing. We're missing out one of the greatest opportunities to provide energy at the same time as empowering our communities. President Officer, energy planning requires a long-term government strategy, but too often we see companies taking a short-term approach, happy to cream off profits and dividends when the sun is shining, but calling for tax cuts and subsidies when prices fall. And the oil sector, large multinationals, having coined in cash for decades, now threaten workers with redundancy because of the downturn in the oil price. In coal, we see Hargreaves threatening to get rid of another 250 skilled coal workers as coal prices fall as you shale gas close, please. impacts on world prices. Scottish Power, we have heard, has the permission to build a new plant at Kackenzie, but little progress. And who can forget Jim Ratcliffe threatening to hold the country to ransom over Ineos? At all, and all this time, we see fuel poverty increase and energy prices rise. President officer, we need a mixed energy policy, one that is more balanced, coming from a range of sources, all of them, all of them operating to the highest environmental standards. Many thanks. And now call on Joan McAlpine, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Balanced energy generation has to be our short-term strategy. Um, that's common sense. And that's why we must continue to urge the UK government's discriminatory charging regime to change uh, as it's damaging Longana and also damaging the future of Scotland's renewable in industry. But there's no contradiction in combining that short-term pragmatism with the long-term ambition to be a greener nation as the WWF report Pathways to Power says is achievable, not tomorrow, but by 2030. The research carried out by the respected energy consultant DNVGL rather flies in the face of the gloomy claims that renewable energy cannot provide base load power supply. There are challenges with every type of generation. In fact, output from a thermal plant can drop off suddenly, posing serious operational challenges, as the National Grid highlighted to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. The WWF report outlines two scenarios, both of which fit within current Scottish Government policy. The first, high, what they call high climate risk scenario, involves the commercialisation of carbon capture and storage technology, while the second, which they call the low climate risk, envisages a future energy supply without the use of CCS on a commercial basis and with no other gas, coal or nuclear plant in the system. And according to WWF and their consultants, these are both technically and economically achievable. And they call on Westminster to make electricity market reform work better for offshore wind in particular, stating that the enduring regime under EMR is constraining the growth of offshore renewables to around one project under the first allocation round, which could severely restrict growth in Scotland. As they say, current lack of ambition and certainty risks stymieing investment in an industry with long lead-in times and a need for deployment at a scale to drive learning and cost reductions. I share the concerns for Longana, which have been expressed across the Chamber and particularly uh, for the future of the workforce. Figures from DEC, however, show that across the course of a year without Longana, Scotland's electricity generation will still exceed demand. We shouldn't forget that Scotland is a net exporter of electricity to the rest of the UK. Our challenge in the long term is to create sustainable jobs. Again, that solution can be found in renewables, a sector which has already led to the establishment of an industry responsible for 11,000 full-time jobs in Scotland and billions of pounds of inward investment. However, there's one key dimension to the renewables revolution that deserves more attention um, in this chamber, and that is energy storage technology. Being the Saudi Arabia of renewables is of little use without somewhere to store all this green energy. Scottish renewables agree and argue that by 2030 we will need better storage as well as increased interconnection. 
Brian Richardson, my constituent and CEO of Energy Storage Scotland, has convincingly argued that the development of storage technology in Scotland presents an exceptional opportunity for training jobs and a place in the global market. And while we have a tried and te tested technology in pump storage, which we lead, there are many other exciting uh, energy storage technologies which are being developed around the world and which our universities, like Harry and Watt in particular, please. are keen to develop further here in Scotland. On March the 5th, I will be hosting a presentation in Parliament by Energy Storage Scotland and Heriot Watts uh, Energy Academy about the development of these technologies, and I hope that members across the Chamber with an interest in these matters will attend. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And my apologies to the member who I have been unable to call, and we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Patrick Harvey up to four minutes. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am grateful to uh, John McAlpine for focusing some of our remarks on the WWF report cited in the Green Amendment. It saves me a little time in the closing speech. But that, that report does set out a clear vision for producing uh, a, 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 a largely fossil fuel-free and nuclear-free energy system, which would be achievable, credible, cheaper than the alternative, lower climate risk, and, yes, secure, uh, and to do that by... 2030. That, that security, I'm afraid with four minutes I don't have time, I'm very sorry. I'm a, that, that security is not something which can be achieved in a standalone basis. No man is an island, they say, no country, uh, even one that looks like an island ge geographically, is an island in energy terms. And it's going to be increasingly important uh, that we have interconnectivity, uh, not just to the rest of the UK, but across the North Sea to the rest of Europe. Uh, and and the, I can't remember who it was, but the phrase importing English electricity was used by somebody during the debate. And I don't think any of us, whatever view we took of the, the constitutional relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK, should be worried about importing English electrons, or indeed exporting electricity to other countries uh, right across the North Sea. There's going to be an increasing need for that interconnectivity. And I would cite, actually, the support of Ian Duncan, the Tory MEP, the other day, who was talking about the need for high-voltage direct current transmission uh, across the North Sea so that we can trade different sources of renewables to match variable supply with various variable demand and do so efficiently without transmission losses. This is part of the future that we have to see. Uh, I think that there was some brief exchange on the question of uh, costs, and in particular in relation to nuclear. Um, I, I wouldn't accuse uh, Mr Fraser of, of deliberately uh, misrepresenting uh, his position or, or the facts, but I would highlight the difference between the rhetoric that we so often hear, particularly from the political right, uh, on issues such as so-called green taxes, the, the parts of the subsidy for renewable energy generation which show up on our bill, I would contrast that with the hidden subsidy for nuclear generation as the taxpayer picks up the tab for the decommissioning of nuclear plant. The dramatically bigger uh, uh, amount of money um, that is going into that. Th there is no subsidy-free solution to our energy challenges. We should not be ashamed of that. We should be acknowledging that we can invest public subsidy in producing an energy system which meets people's needs securely, not just today, but for the long term, and that means sustainably. None of this, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, should deflect us from the need to address the questions of transition and to do so justly. Neil Finlay's comments on the uh, industrial heritage from fossil fuels uh, I, I think are significant, but we not, must look to the future. And we have the opportunity to do something that fossil fuel or nuclear cannot do, which is to decentralise the ownership and thereby decentralise the economic benefits from our energy system. Renewables lend themselves to this in a way that fossil fuel and nuclear simply don't. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the final analysis, we need to recognise that this brief little blip uh, in this planet's history, this tiny century in which uh, a bunch of allegedly smart apes have become so hooked on every form of fossil fuel that they could extract, has bound us intimately and intricately with these products. This period of history is coming to an end, and unless we get to grips with the need for a just transition, then we'll not only be failing our ecological needs, we'll be failing our social and economic needs as well.
Thank you very much. I now call on Lewis MacDonald. Maximum four minutes, please, Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. And this has been a welcome debate and has touched on many aspects of power generation policy in Scotland. But I'm glad that, indeed, I particularly enjoy Patrick Harvey's effort not to say that no island is an island despite the sea around it. But the energy policy he was putting forward, I know, was a very serious proposition. But I'm glad that Cara Hilton, as the constituency member, focused so firmly on Lunganet and the West Fife economy. This is not just a debate about electricity generating options for the future, although it is that. It is also about support for people working in the power industry today and facing the prospect of losing their jobs. Of course, we support ongoing engagement between Scottish Power and National Grid, indeed, between the Scottish and UK governments on this as on other issues. We do not, however, accept the assertion that the threat to Lunganet simply comes from the transmission charging regime, even if that regime does indeed stand in need of ongoing reform. The threat to Lungana's future comes principally from the requirement to phase out high carbon emission power stations across Europe, a requirement that is supported by both the Scottish and the UK governments. <clears throat> Nor do we accept the proposition that the way to ensure security of supply is to give the Scottish Government the power to set Scottish specific standards in this field, as the SNP amendment proposes. Rather than dividing up responsibilities for capacity and security of supply at this juncture, Labour believes that now is the time to move in the opposite direction by pulling together existing responsibilities in this field. Those responsibilities are currently divided among DEC, the UK Department for Energy and Climate Change, Ofgem as the regulator and National Grid as the system operator. Rather than these bodies having to negotiate their different objectives to resolve issues such as those at Longanet, we would like to see a single Energy Security Board with responsibility to take a lead in providing a joined-up approach. In that case, we might also find that a more joined-up approach can be taken to issues like transmission charges. It certainly makes little sense to us to separate off the issue of security of supply in Scotland from the parallel issues in England and Wales when we operate a single electricity transmission and trading market uh, and when Scotland consumes power from England and vice versa on a weekly basis. The Scottish Government does, of course, already have responsibilities which bear upon energy choices in Scotland, namely planning and environmental consents. Licensing powers in relation to unconventional gas extraction will follow before too long. The question has been raised today, for example, of whether the Scottish Government's policy of a temporary presumption against planning consent for onshore fracking also applies to the onshore aspects of underground coal gasification below the Firth of Forth, and if not, why not? And we do, of course, already know how effective a planning presumption against development can be in relation to nuclear energy. That approach by the SNP has effectively deterred investment in new nuclear capacity in Scotland. And by do doing so, it constrains the choices Scotland can make in seeking to move towards a low carbon future. Most importantly, as long as there is a need for baseload generation alongside intermittent renewable power, it makes new unabated coal burning power stations more likely and not less likely in the future. New unabated coal is not the answer to the crisis facing Longanet. We need Scottish Power as owners of the power station to live up to some of the promises of investment it has made in the past and we need government agencies at every level to work with the company if it does that on reducing costs. But we also need government at every level to get serious about life after unabated coal both locally in Fife and nationally, if Scotland's commitment to a low carbon economy is to survive into the 2020s. And that is what we call on the Scottish Government to do today. Many thanks. And I now call on Fergus Ewing, Minister, maximum six minutes, please. Thank you, Thank you Presiding Officer. Um, I, I, I'm glad that we have had the opportunity to debate this today, especially because of the imminent threat of the premature closure of Long Hallet. Um, in response to some of the points that have been made in the debate, which has been wide-ranging, and I can't really answer all of them, I think we have made considerable progress in renewables deployment in Scotland, with over 44% of gross electricity consumption met from renewable sources in 2013. And I think that has been broadly welcomed in this country. But we've always been clear, presiding officer, that our renewables target does not mean, and cannot mean, that Scotland will rely on renewables generation alone. I have always argued that backup and base load are necessary, and members will therefore have heard me uh, uh, argue the case for the continued life extension 
uh, the continued uh, life of uh, our nuclear stations at Hunterston and Torness, uh, both of which I visited. Uh, I have to point out too, Mr Fraser, that there is another error, unfortunately, in his motion, because he says that the nuclear stations are due to close by 225. That is not the case. Uh, both stations are due to close in 2023, although we understand that there may be a life extension in the case of Torness sought by EDF. It's unfortunate there's a factual error, and perhaps in the scheme of things it's not as important as the key issue, which is the immediate threat of Long Gannett. But uh, it is nonetheless uh, an error, along with the other one that I identified. Um, our, policy support, our policy supports clean thermal generation as a part of a diverse energy mix. When I consented Kakenzi, the proposed gas plant of one gigawatt, it was on the basis uh, that as a condition of that consent, it must be CCS ready. Our policy in coal to respond to Mr. McDonald's uh, line of argument was that it must have CCS on 300 megawatts. Now, all of this is not new because it's been set out in our EGPS, perhaps because that document is not what you would call the most riveting read. It's uh, maybe not widely understood, but there it is. And I hope members would accept that at least I am being consistent here. Uh, so what, what, do we, what do we say about the key issue, which is the immediate threat of the premature closure of Longana. I think that really is the key issue here. Uh, and I don't want this to be political because uh, it is, as I think Cara Hilton fairly said, too important for that. Uh, I mean, when I visited the plant again on Monday and spoke to members of the Prospect Union, uh, I was uh, impressed by their obvious concern about this issue. We all know that the reasons that have been enunciated about uh, Climate change, as Mr. Harvey has, has fairly argued about emissions, uh, about the need to move to a low-carbon economy, that Longanet does not have an infinite life. And indeed, the plant itself and the hope of the staff is Project 220, that it hoped to continue to operate then. The fact that last year was its most successful operational year, I would have thought proves that it is capable of doing so. And the expenditure on tackling some of the emissions, the sulphur dioxide emissions, has been very substantial indeed for which the company should have due, due credit. But the signal factor of this debate, stripping it down to its essence, is this, that in addition to the legal requirements to reduce emissions, in addition to the duties to meet its carbon levy, duties which are faced by all coal-fired generation stations across the UK. In addition to that, it must find an additional £40 million. And as Mr Macdonald said, that is a very substantial sum. Were Langanet located in the southeast of England, then there would be a payment of several million pounds for it to contribute to the grid. This problem is not new. Mr Harvey pointed that out. Indeed, the Scottish Affairs Committee identified it in 2003-04 but it recommended that it be dealt with. And that's why Project Transmit took place, with the aim of trying to bring about a fairer resolution. And that was due to come in, in the minded two proposals of 214, but that has been delayed, and therefore an answer is not yet here. My hope, presiding officer, is that National Grid and Scottish Power will reach a resolution of the negotiations, which is not over the transmission charging regime, it is about a supplementary balancing reserve. National Grid have a budget of around a billion pounds. A relatively small amount of that will secure the future. Regrettably, to date, despite the First Minister raising this with the Prime Minister, we have been unable to persuade the UK Government to intervene. In conclusion, I think I'm... Do I have time for signing off? Well, I can only give you six minutes. It's your choice. Uh, well, all right. Uh, thank, I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. I, I agree with much of what he said about Project Transmit and these delays. Many of them are not of the UK government's making. But can you explain why is transmission charging such a problem for Longanet and other conventional generators, but the same regime which applies to renewable energy isn't preventing massive re renewable energy development going ahead today? Minister. Very simple, because wind farms have higher output than similar plants in England. Coal-fired power stations have the same output. It's a very simple answer. Let's get back to the key point. Uh, this is very serious. Unless there is a resolution, my information is that Scottish Power must intimate to the national grid no later than the end of March that Longanet will be closed. Therefore, unless these negotiations are concluded successfully, there is a great deal at stake. 
That is a matter which I have taken extremely seriously, not for months, but for years. Scottish Power were optimistic at one point that a deal was being reached. We are not uh, satisfied that the assumptions made by National Grid are prudent. And in fact, many Minister. of our experts take the opposite view. We will come back to this chamber, presiding officer, on this topic again. It is too important to treat it as a political football. Thank you. And I now call on Alex Johnston to wind up the debate. Mr Johnston, maximum eight minutes less would be helpful if possible. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. This was a, an attempt by the Conservative Party to bring forward a, an issue which is of genuine concern to many people in Scotland. It was an attempt, perhaps, to find a way of bringing the positions of different political parties in this government together at such an important time. And yet, it has served as one more opportunity for political parties to set out radically differing positions uh, without recognising the imminence of the decision-making that is in process. The truth is that Scotland is a cold country. Scotland is a country where energy is important. And it's a country where the availability and the affordability of energy is absolutely critical, not only on a domestic basis, but also in terms of our industrial development and economic growth. It's important that no one is left to freeze on the top of a tower block somewhere where the electricity is too expensive to buy. But it's equally important that when Scottish workers go to their jobs, that the lights come on and the motors begin to run. That's why the generation of electricity has always been at the heart of Conservative Party concerns about energy policy here in Scotland. And we have been raising this subject for years. We've been raising it for so long that the landscape changes radically over time. Once we could say quite clearly that Scotland had five main power stations and that they together produce more electricity than Scotland could use. We talked a lot about Scotland exporting electricity, slightly misleading perhaps given the commitments we have to supply across the Northern Ireland inter interconnector, but nevertheless we were electricity exporters. In the intervening time, and largely at the instigation of this government, we have seen a massive shift to onshore wind and have become increasingly reliant on it. At the same time, we've seen Cokenzie close. We've seen Hunterston downgraded. We've even seen Bodham reducing its output. Long Annett and Torness remain the only two power stations in Scotland capable of achieving anything near their required output. Our need for nuclear energy is something which everybody actually agrees on. We don't agree about replacing that capacity, but nevertheless, this government and others and different political parties in Scotland have been very keen to see the life of Hunterston extended. And we've heard today from the Minister that the same approach will be taken from on Torness. That means that everybody understands we are reliant on nuclear energy here in Scotland. It's simply how long can we afford to go before we consider how it might be replaced. The whole issue has been thrown into focus by the very immediate threat to Long Annett. Long Annett is a high capacity coal fired power station and one which is under threat for a number of reasons, not least the fact that it does not meet what are likely to be the European uh, environmental le uh, legislation that it will have to survive under in the future. But we've said a lot today about the grid charging regime. And I think, again, we've had perhaps a misleading representation. The national grid is not free. It costs money to build and it costs money to maintain. The current regime, whether we like it or not, is designed to incentivise uh, the pursuit of low transmission costs and to minimise losses within the grid. Now, I support the Scottish Government's point that a more favourable charging regime would be welcome, and I hope that we can see that come forward. Nevertheless, it's ironic that that regime, if it is successfully achieved, will be one in which Scottish consumers pay more, and Scottish, uh, sorry, English consumers pay more, and Scottish generators pay less. 
The truth of the matter is that we need to look ahead in this difficult situation. We need to have a clear picture of where our energy will come from in 5, 10 and 20 years' time. We know that the capacity we have today will close down. We know that Long Annet will not survive uh, beyond 2020 and we know uh, in its current form and we know that our nuclear capacity, thanks to the Minister, will disappear most likely by 2023. That leaves us in a position where perhaps our reliability and affordability of electricity may be called into question. Although, if we were to allow Chick Brodie to do the mathematics, we perhaps could avoid that difficult conclusion. <laughs> Given that the strike price for nuclear energy, which he clearly stated to be £92.50 per megawatt hour, is apparently significantly more expensive than the equivalent strike price for onshore wind of £95 per <laughs> megawatt hour. Uh, a secret which he declined to tell us when challenged earlier on. The reality is that we are in a difficult position. We need to address a key challenge. The transmission, re and remember, the transmission regime does not discriminate between generating methods. And it seems perfectly reasonable that if investment is being made in onshore wind today, at the same latitude as those power stations that we're discussing, then it's ironic that this is a threat to coal-fired um, reserves, yet it is not a threat to wind generation. And I think the Minister was slightly disingenuous when he suggested that this was somehow because the output for wind, onshore wind capacity in Scotland was higher than that in the south of England. Well, that's a fact that is absolutely undeniable and has absolutely nothing to do with the impact of transmission <laughs> charging. We've had one or two key contributions today, uh, and I would like to draw attention to the first three quarters of the speech that was given by Cara Hilton. She, as a local member, made it quite clear that the future of the workers at Long Annet should always be at the front of our mind. And that's why it's so important that we remember that this is a, an important uh, power station for the supply of electricity, but also a very major employer within its area. Sadly, Cara went on to spoil her contribution by reciting some myth and superstition about the shale gas extraction techniques uh, we may adopt in the future. The key proposal, however, that was made in this opening speech by my colleague Murdo Fraser was that we should consider the opportunity to look forward and build a gas-fired power station at the Long Annet site. It is the case that we have an opportunity there to use the infrastructure that already exists, the skills that already exist, and ironically, perhaps even the fuel supplies that already exist. Please don't perhaps take if the government sanctioned the drilling of a few wells, they might discover that the Long Annet itself is very close to a supply of energy that could supply it. I'm afraid you need to so, finish. So, as a consequence, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I support the motion in the name of Murdo Fraser, Murdo Fraser and commend it to the Chamber. Thank you. That concludes the debate on an energy strategy for Scotland and we now move to the next item of business. We're going into the next item of business very short of time and it is a debate on motion number 12385 in the name of Liz Smith on STEM education in Scottish schools. Could those members who wish to speak in the debate press the request to speak buttons now, please? But I'm afraid I have to give warning that I may not be able to call every member who wishes to speak. I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion, please. Maximum 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this Parliament has obviously just debated energy policy, and there were robust differences of opinion but clearly an agreement on all sides of the chamber about the crucial importance of the sector in Scotland because of the rich natural resources with which this nation is so blessed, because of the resulting investment potential and, of course, the opportunity for future employment. But that sector is not alone when it comes to its heavy reliance on scientific and technological skills. And we know that by 2030, 7 million jobs in the UK will be wholly dependent on these science-based skills. 
Indeed, in the eyes of many economic commentators, Scotland's importance in this sector could grow more strongly than it does in the rest of the UK. In the Scottish Government's own 2012 CIAG report, energy and life sciences were identified, rightly, as the two key sectors when it comes to skills training. And therefore, it is plainly obvious that we must do everything we can to ensure that we are able to provide a highly trained workforce which has these scientific skills. At present, however, Deputy Presiding Officer, our ability to achieve that is being somewhat hampered. Now, that's not to say that there aren't many encouraging signs. There are. According to the latest HESA statistics, a growing number of Scottish students are opting to study courses in computing. That was up by 21% in the past two years. And I note the Labour Party's reference to computing in its amendment, which we would have been happy to support, but for the reference to the 50p top tax rate. Mathematical sciences, it grew by 26% in the same period. And engineering and technology numbers have arisen by 10% in each case. There are also some encouraging signs in SQA higher uptake in science, given that there have been 4,689 more presentations in science subjects in the last five school sessions. Although I have to say on this point, I do question whether it was the right decision by the SQA to abandon the geology hire this year, when it could easily have been argued that this science base is perhaps the most relevant to many of the offshore technology industries in Scotland, which looks certain to flourish in the years ahead, irrespective of what happens to the oil industry. That decision is even more extraordinary because of the trends elsewhere, when it comes to the need for an interdisciplinary approach, which after all is the key philosophy which underpins the curriculum for excellence. Indeed, it is exactly why science exams uh, are moving towards a much more uh, focused basis when it comes to open questions, so moving away perhaps from the uh, focus that it used to have purely on the traditional approach to uh, knowledge base. And that's come at the suggestion of representatives in the Curriculum of Excellence design teams who have come from industry. And I have to say, I think that's a good thing. The complementary move is to make science much more meaningful to the everyday lives of pupils. In the case of organic carbon chemistry, for example, how it affects our lives in the form of fuel, cosmetics, plastics, rather than just to give the scientific facts which describe its processes. And that interdisciplinary approach is important. And it was why I think the Scottish Government thought it would be achieved when they introduced the Science Scottish Baccalaureate until, unfortunately, it set the bar far too low and gave it virtually no distinctive characteristics from the separate higher and advanced hires. And it's the reason why only 110 pupils across the whole of Scotland are taking it and why the universities don't really rate it as an added value qualification. And that interdisciplinary approach is also something that's at the core of the Wood Commission. The needs of Scotland and our young people are changing fast in what is a fiercely global economy. And they are changing because employers are wanting to be much more finely tuned when it comes to the labour force which is much more flexible and more skilled when it comes to the diverse needs of the economy. So while there ought to be plenty of incentives, there remains very considerable concern amongst many of Scotland's foremost industries that we do not have anything like the numbers required to ensure that we will match our economic potential in the decades to come. With greater diversity being required in the energy industry, with the debates about climate change, about transport, about communication, and the very significant challenges within the health industry, there is no, need, there is no end to the need for well-trained scientists and engineers. 70% of Scotland's exports come from science, engineering, and technology-related sectors, yet the oil and gas industries continue to express their concern. All of which brings me to teacher numbers in science. Now, set aside the political rammy that is going on between the Scottish Government and COSLA about whose fault it is about teacher numbers, and let's look at the Scottish Government's own statistics when it comes to teacher numbers in science and maths. With the exception of biology, for which there are now precisely three more teachers in Scotland than there were in 2008, the numbers in maths, chemistry, physics, general science and technology have all declined, in some cases like maths and physics, quite significantly. For example, there are 383 fewer maths teachers in Scotland now than when the SNP came to power. How ironic is it then that at the very time where we see some increase in the number of pupils wanting to take up science courses, we see the number of teachers going down in the opposite direction? Now, I am not somebody who is persuaded of the argument that there is absolute direct correlation between teacher numbers and the ability to improve educational outcomes. But nonetheless, I think it is very hard indeed to argue with a 9% rise in pupils sitting mathematics, biology, chemistry, physics and technology, there is a corresponding drop of just under 10% in teacher numbers, and that is bound to have a serious impact. So let me suggest some positive things that we could do. 
In the first instance, I think there is a very important issue about primary school science. In the autumn last year, the Royal Society of Chemistry made the call to have specialist science teachers in primary schools. The Scottish Conservatives backed that call then, and we back it again just now. Because there can be no more an important time to inspire youngsters than in primary school. And we urge the Scottish Government this afternoon to tell us what it's going to do about this issue. We also need to bring in some of our top science graduates to school education. Two things can do that. We can learn something from elsewhere in the UK, like the National Science Learning Centre in York, which provides very generous bursaries for teachers of science who want to enhance their CPD. And secondly, via programmes akin to the Teach First programme. Now, I agree wholeheartedly with the need for 100% teacher registration. And I think it's absolutely right that both the independent sector as well as the state sector is making the move to do just that, long overdue in my view. But that's not to say that we cannot also have fully accredited Teach First programme running alongside to assist those who can bring additional experience to our classrooms. Many in the English system uh, have been able uh, not to have a job in Scotland because they are banned from doing so. And that is simply unacceptable. And just to take up the theme of Professor Lindsay Patterson, who argued two years ago at a Royal Society of Edinburgh event that we could do much more to help our very gifted pupils from whichever part of the educational system they may come and from whatever background, we need to do far more in that direction. It fell on deaf ears at the time, but I think it is something, uh, particularly in the context of science, that has considerable uh, merit. Now, I want to talk a little bit about teacher workforce planning. Not an easy task in any sphere, because it's very difficult to get the demand and supply of teachers fully aligned, particularly in what is a very fast-changing world. And recently, after the uh, Scottish Government's initial troubles on teacher numbers, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, predecessor moved with some degree of success to make that process a little more flexible. Two things matter in this whole thing. Firstly, the absolute trust between central government and local government which at current time is obviously on a very sticky wicket. And secondly, greater flexibility when it comes up to freeing the supply of teachers. And can I just declare an interest as I'm a fully uh, paid up member of the GTCS in Scotland, but I think it is absolutely right just now to say that much more has to be done to ensure that we can encourage a greater diversity of teachers in Scotland. There have been serious issues about fully qualified teachers south of the border who have been prevented from teaching in Scotland simply because they don't have a Scottish qualification. By all means, carefully check that they meet the correct professional standards, but don't bar them, because if we do, we are preventing some top-class people from coming into the teaching profession. And that is something that, again, I hope the Scottish Government uh, will address, because it has a direct influence on the number of science teachers in our schools. So to conclude, we have debated science issues many times in this chamber, and I pay tribute to Ian Gray as a member who has a very distinct interest in that. And whilst I have no doubt whatsoever that there are some very good things happening out there, the central issue remains that there is a declining number of teachers in STEM subjects at the very time where there is an increasing number of pupils wanting to opt for science courses. And of course, the very urgent need for this to happen in the benefit of economic development. And the weakness of not having sufficient qualified science teachers in our primary schools is something that I think we need to have urgently addressed. The evidence which comes from our academic bodies, almost all of it extremely well researched over a very long period of time, is absolutely compelling. And it's on that basis, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Dr Alistair Allen to speak to and move Amendment 12385.3, maximum seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as Ms Smith will know, this debate follows a not dissimilar motion in some ways, uh, tabled by Ian Gray in a members' debate some five weeks ago, raising uh, some of the, the issues which I'm sure we'll, we'll speak about today around science and school. And as then, uh, as Ms. Ms Smith mentioned, there are many areas uh, in which we can agree across the parties. Although uh, uh, one thing I will say is that I'm sure she will not be entirely uh, surprised that uh, I disagree with uh, some of the premises in her motion. Uh, and that reflects the fact that uh, her motion is being amended today. As our amendment makes clear that this government agrees that all young people need a solid grounding in STEM education. This grounding starts in primary one and builds progress progressively 
through primary school. The science, technologies and maths experiences and outcomes of Curriculum for Excellence are making learning more exciting, relevant and fun for all pupils. In secondary school, this learning and teaching continues through the broad general education to the end of S3, and we know that STEM subject specialists at the secondary stages in particular are knowledgeable and enthusiastic about those subject areas. All of this grounding, though, is ensuring not only that record numbers of young people are taking science, technologies and math subjects, as has been alluded to, um, but also that the education system is contributing to ensuring that we have a more scientifically literate population. I will. I, I thank the Minister for giving way. I absolutely agree with the Minister. But at this particular time, when we do have more pupils wanting to access STEM subjects, and it's uh, obviously showing some trend with higher education and further education too, is that not make it even more crucial that we increase the number of teachers in these particular areas? Minister. Well, I think uh, there is a, a, an acknowledgement. I'm glad to hear uh, that uh, the, the member does acknowledge that there are links between uh, teacher numbers uh, and uh, the experience of, of young people in learning. Um, but uh, I think I would certainly acknowledge, too, uh, the issue that there are, is around some specific subjects, not least computing science, which has been mentioned, uh, where uh, I accept there has been a reduction in the number of teachers uh, available in this subject and where there are efforts underway just now uh, to deal with that. I'm pleased, for instance, to note that the, the government chaired teacher workforce planning working group met this morning to discuss, among things, uh, this very subject. And I'm pleased also um, that uh, the targets that we are setting for a number of these subjects, not least computing science, are, are targets uh, which move upwards uh, every year, and I certainly plan for them to do that. The qualifications uh, front uh, is very important as well, and uh, as has been alluded to, maths, physics, chemistry and biology are all amongst the six uh, more popular uh, national five and higher qualifications uh, sat in 2014. And when compared to 2006, the number of pupils taking hires uh, in 2014 in biology has increased by 14.2%, in maths by 17%, and in physics by 18%, and chemistry by 24 per cent. So, presiding officer, I suggest that this ongoing enthusiasm and positive interest in science and maths in schools is influenced by the considerable investment uh, in what I'm sure Ms Smith will acknowledge uh, and understand why to have been uh, a very challenging fiscal period, uh, that all this investment is happening uh, uh, with the cooperation and the involvement, obviously, of local authorities and government together, allowing STEM in schools to flourish. And not only in learning and curriculum support, but also in the quality of our teachers and of our school buildings and infrastructure. And it is worth saying that the 1.8 billion that Scotland Schools for the Future programme represents demonstrates that commitment uh, and ensures that we have uh, science facilities in our new schools uh, that are indeed fit uh, environments to learn in, in the 21st century. But arguably the most important thing in all of this is the quality of our teachers. And so we are committed to having the right number and quality of teachers in our schools. That's why we just secured the commitment of each of Scotland's local authorities to maintain teacher numbers over the coming year. And we have added £10 million to the £41 million already included in the local government settlement explicitly for maintaining those teacher numbers. Now, Ms Smith also mentioned the issue of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, and I appreciate her, her knowledge she has of that personally, but I think it's worth uh, being very clear about this, that as an independent body, they will make their own rules, but I do understand that they are alive to the issues of making sure that we deal uh, with hot spots uh, around the country where there is a need uh, to ensure that teachers come into the system. But I have to be equally clear that uh, I would be very surprised, uh, not trying to prejudge them in any way, but I would be very surprised on the basis of what the GTCS have said till now um, if they were flexible to the point where they were enthusiastic about anyone who was not a qualified teacher becoming a teacher in a Scottish school. I appreciate the member wasn't saying that, uh, but some voices elsewhere in the country uh, have taken us down that line. Last year, we founded the Scottish College for Educational Leadership and earlier this week announced that from 2018-19, eh, the new master's qualification for headship will become ma a mandatory requirement for new head teachers. 
There are, I accept, challenges, and we recognise that uh, STEM subject teacher numbers have faced challenges in recent years, and we are, uh, as I mentioned, taking steps to address that through the, challenge, through the, through the uh, targets that we set. Final minute, Minister. I would really, in that case, like to conclude by saying, Presiding Officer, uh, there are many areas in which we can agree to work together, not least uh, one uh, which is uh, important to this government, which is to ensure uh, that the number of uh, women uh, entering science professions uh, is increased and encouraged. We are not complacent about the challenges there are. We recognise the issues that need addressing, and we are doing that. We are supporting primary and secondary teachers and looking to find solutions to the many challenges of recruitment. That's what you would expect any competent and sensitive government to do, and that's exactly why that's what we're doing. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray to speak to and move Amendment 12385.1. Maximum five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to move the amendment uh, in my name. Uh, uh, Ms Smith is right. The teaching of science is a subject close to my heart, but more importantly, it is central to this country's economic future. The Institute of Physics calculate that Scotland has 100,000 jobs in physics-based industry, some 4% of the workforce. But because these are high-skilled, high-value jobs, that drives 10% of the economy. And that can only increase, indeed. At a recent event in the Parliament, the Institution of Engineering and Technology told us that by 2022, we will need 147,000 more engineers uh, than in 2012. Yet science teaching in this country faces what I have called before a perfect storm. The Learned Societies Group have demonstrated that our schools do not have the resources to teach practical science properly. They have warned us of a looming shortage in science teachers, most notably in the crucial area of computer science, where numbers fell by 14% in only two years. And the Learned Societies Group know that the targets for teacher training in computer science have been raised, but they report that we cannot fill those places. So they are uh, not addressing the situation where 43 of our high schools don't offer computing science at all. The Institute of Physics recently told a meeting in this parliament of a similar shortage of physics teachers and reported that the brightest teachers were heading for England. And no wonder. Here is the latest New Scientist. A whole page advert received 25,000 tax free to retrain as a physics teacher. That's not teach first. That's the equivalent of PGCE, a £25,000 bursary to train in physics. Of course we'd be physics teachers who are mobile or voting with their feet. Meanwhile, as the new curriculum rolls out, pupil numbers in STEM subjects are actually falling. I know the minister quotes higher numbers holding up. But the problem is coming behind that. Presentations at levels 3, 4 and 5 are down. 5.6% down in physics, 8.8% in chemistry, 8.9% in biology, 9.4% in maths, and not surprisingly, 22.5% in computer science. And the government's own survey of numeracy levels reports a significant drop too at all levels. Minister. I thank the member for giving way. He will appreciate the difficulty of making, as I'm sure he does, appreciate the difficulty of making comparisons between one exam system and another, uh, given the changes that there have been at that level in education, and also will appreciate that many people who do not choose to take a science subject in fourth year will do so in fifth year. In well, the point is, the figures he quotes do not take account of the new curriculum moving through into higher and advanced higher. So, not enough equipment, not enough teachers, perhaps not enough pupils, and not enough basic numeracy skills. So where on earth are we going to get those extra engineers? Well, in particular, we know that unless we do something, we won't get them from girls, and we won't get them from young people from our poorest families. NUS Scotland's excellent briefing for this debate tells us 86% of entrants to university engineering courses are still men, and only 9.3% of entrants come from the poorest fifth of our communities. They are going to miss out on these opportunities of the future, and we are going to waste their potential. The government's attainment fund is welcome, and we have welcomed it, but it is not enough. It is temporary, and its targeting is flawed. That's why we want to add an additional £125 million to that fund over the next parliament 
paid for by raising taxes on the most prosperous of our citizens and targeted ruthlessly where it can make the most impact. That would mean that pupils in this city, for example, would benefit rather than being ignored by the government's attainment fund. And as for girls, NUS make an excellent suggestion that the Research Excellence Grant funding should depend on action to address the gender gap. But the truth is, uh, as Ms Smith said, we must also inspire girls to take an early interest in science before gender stereotyping takes hold. That's seconds. why the Royal Society of Chemistry is right to suggest a science teacher for every primary school. In my own constituency, Dunbar Primary School has its own science teacher. And it is no coincidence that next week we'll see that school's fifth science festival attracting over 8,000 participants in an ever-expanding variety of events. Close, please. Presiding officer, there is little to oppose in the government's motion, but in truth it reeks of complacency and abjures any self-criticism or even self-examination. It ignores the voices of teachers, scientists and industry. You know, you must close. science is always ill-served by smug self-satisfaction, and we will pay a price for it in our future. Thank you. I'm afraid we're very tight for time. Speeches of four minutes, but if members could take less, I might be able to call everyone. Uh, Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very well aware of the concerns that have been raised by Liz, in, in Liz Smith's, Smith's motion. Of course, the Education Committee has taken evidence on this. We, we, uh, on the back of the work by the Learning Societies Group, um, asked them to come in and give us evidence on this particular issue. So we're very well aware of it. And, of course, the debate that Ian Gray uh, sponsored a, a few weeks ago. So we're well aware of the, the situation, but I have to say it doesn't really reflect, I don't think, some of the comments, um, the reality of the situation. If you accepted what um, uh, Ian Gray has just said, I think, and some others, about there is some sort of cataclysm going on in Scottish schools with regard to science, I don't accept that view of it at all. The Scottish Government, for example, is investing in science education. It's providing, for example, some £900,000 per annum to the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre to support the professional learning of teachers. Now, the reason that's important is because that, that particular money, that money, that funding stream includes a programme that is focused on primary teachers to raise their confidence and skills in science. So directly addressing some of the issues that others have raised. In fact, the government's program, the program for government for 2014-15 states, and I want to quote, to continue to support improvement in the learning and teaching of science, technology, engineering and mathematics in schools, with a particular focus on primary schools. Uh, well, very briefly. Liz Smith. Just very quickly, would he acknowledge that there are different trends within the STEM subjects and teacher numbers than there are in some of the other secondary subjects? That's part of the concern. Stuart Maxwell. I, I'm, going to try, I'm going to try and come on to teacher numbers in a moment if the member uh, uh, excuses me. One of the recommendations in the final report from the Commission for De Developing Scotland's Young Workforce is on STEM, and it says a focus on STEM should sit at the heart of the development of Scotland's young workforce. And it calls for long-term partnerships to be established between schools, colleges and employers to bring about significant change. The Scottish Government is committed to implementing the recommendations of the Young Workforce Commission. So the very recommendation on STEM that many folk people have been calling for it is already something that the Scottish Government has agreed to take forward. On the issue of, of underrepresentation of women in STEM subjects, we all, we all understand that is a, is, is a problem and a serious one and has to be addressed. But the Cabinet Secretary for Education said there is no such thing as a girl's job or a boy's job. And any perception that such unhealthy boundaries still exist need to be changed, whether they're held by employers or young people exploring their career options. In fact, the letter of guidance issued to the Scottish Funding Council on 31 July 2014 by the former Education Secretary, Mike Russell, said, I want a renewed focus on reducing gender segregation and participation. Too many college and university courses are dominated by either men or women. Action is being taken. Of course, it's not quick enough. Of course, it, hasn't, it doesn't have an immediate impact in terms of some of the changes we want to see. But it has been recognised by the Scottish Government and efforts are being made to try and reverse some of these trends. On the issue of students taking science, of course, last year there was an increase in entries at higher in all three of the main science subjects, including bio biology, chemistry and physics, and pass rates are holding up very strongly indeed. So I think, as I said earlier, it's not the cataclysm that some have suggested. On the teachers' number issue, of course, the Deputy First Minister already announced that £51 million is on offer for councils for 2015-16 to protect teacher numbers. And, of course, I, I won't quote um, the head of the EIS who came to committee um, earlier this year, but also in the, in the uh, news reports, 
and made very clear his view about the actions of individual councils and their responsibility uh, about keeping teacher numbers up. There was a deal struck, but it takes two to tango when a deal is struck. The government it, it, it made sure it held up its part of the bargain. It's about time that some of our local authorities held up their side of the bargain in terms of teacher numbers, and then we maybe wouldn't have some of the problems we are facing with teacher numbers declining. Thank you very much. I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, unlike my three uh, Labour colleagues in front of me, each of whom is a distinguished scientist or engineer, uh, I gave up science at 15 and have spent the last uh, 50 years of my life regretting it. Uh, I have tried to remedy that in various ways, but I'm passionate about science, certainly, and ensuring that more people uh, continue to study and enjoy science. I mean, the economic arguments of that have been well articulated by all the front bench uh, speakers, but I think, basically, if, it, if we get this right in school, it surely must be intrinsically interesting and endlessly fascinating for uh, pupils. And I say pupils because, of course, it should start from a very early uh, age. But there are certain worrying uh, features that have already been highlighted in this debate. The number of science teachers, again, that has been uh, well rehearsed, particularly in computer science uh, and physics. Uh, secondly, there is a problem in relation to the practice uh, of, of science. Clearly, that is uh, one of the areas which is potentially very attractive to young people if they can be more hands-on with science. But one of the main features of the Learned Scientists this group report was the, the reliance on external funding, which is featured in the, in the Labour motion. And for example, 82% of secondary schools said they didn't have sufficient resources uh, for uh, equipment and consumables for practical work. So I think that is uh, a very serious problem. And Professor Sally Brown, I noticed, highlighted that at the Education Committee uh, uh, three weeks or so uh, ago. There's, there's been a bit of a disagreement about the number uh, of uh, students taking uh, uh, sciences, but I think Ian Gray did make an important point, and again, I noticed this was referred to in that same Education Committee session. I won't uh, write, read out the whole quote, but Dr Beveridge said, the figures that give us concern are those for the new curriculum for excellent courses, which have only reached S4 level in schools. Having looked at these figures, we are concerned that we are seeing decreases in all the sciences. So clearly there has to be a watching eye kept on that, because that would be an issue of enormous concern if one consequence, unintended consequence of the curriculum for excellence was less people studying STEM subjects. So what do we do about it? A partnership, a more partnership with colleges hasn't come up in the debate uh, today, but I think that's an important uh, area that could be explored. But clearly central to the motion, and, uh, uh, and we support that in our amendment, is having su a science subject leader in primary schools. And I think this is vitally important. I think the other way to look at this is perhaps having science requirements on primary teachers, but that's not going to happen uh, for the existing teachers in primary schools. So that suggestion from the Royal Society of Chemistry, which I think the Royal Society of Edinburgh has also made, is, I think, very important. I have to say I'm very impressed after my granddaughter has been for one and a half years in, in primary school at the science, but I imagine as you go up primary school, it's more important that the teachers should really have uh, a grasp of science, which many of them clearly don't have. So I think we do have to do something about science in uh, primary schools. Uh, the other uh, issue highlighted in the motion, which we also support, is of course uh, uh, more women, uh, uh, more female science uh, graduates. And Ian Gray again gave the figures for um, uh, engineering, which are particularly stark, 86% of entrants to engineers being men. And I was certainly very uh, privileged to be at the uh, engineering event in the parliament recently, not, be not least because Naomi Mitchison, young woman engineer of the year, works uh, as an engineer in my constituency and I was very pleased to have a conversation with her then and clearly she's emphasised the importance the, of changing the perception of gender in engineering but that has to start uh, much earlier on of course uh, in the school system uh, I was going to say before gender stereotypes build up we all know that those come at a very early stage but they must be challenged that's clearly uh, very important and the last point last but by no means least is a uh, positive action on the attainment gap so that uh, more opportunities uh, for STEM subjects and uh, careers in STEM subjects can arise for those from the most disadvantaged areas. Exactly four minutes. Many thanks. Christian Allard to be followed by Liam McCarthy. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome the Conservative debate today on education. I note that the Institute of Physics in Scotland said that we should do more to encourage uh, female science graduates. 
And I think we are doing just that, uh, not only the Scottish Government, but all of us in this Parliament across the political parties have done a lot to address gender and science, technology, engineering and mathematics participation. And I would like to add something into this. It's, it's not an all and be all. I, I, I like the words from the briefing of NSU and US Scotland. When they say that STEM education is a crucial part of our education system in Scotland, however, we must ensure that our focus in this area is not the exclusion of other subject provision. And that, I think, Les Mestit talked about that at, at the start. And I would like to, to point that out and maybe remind Mordo Fraser, who's just sitting behind uh, uh, Les Smith, that languages are very important as well. And French is very important as well in our school. So we've got to make sure that all these things are very much promoted. Yes, of course. Les Smith, uh, I, I thank the member. I, I entirely agree with it. Of course, it can't be to the exclusion of other subjects. But I think the, the main, one of the main drivers in this is the needs of the economy. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why there has to be much more focus on the STEM subject. Krishna Lai. Indeed, the needs of the economy. Tonight in Edinburgh, there is uh, the French ambassador, the French UK ambassador, who is meeting a lot of French companies operating here in Scotland. Yeah, I will suggest to uh, uh, Liz Smith, maybe to suggest to Mordo Fraser uh, to, uh, to maybe change his comments this morning and making sure that economic, it's what it's all about, and we need to have a well-rounded education for our children and to make sure we can participate to the economy economy in Scotland. And it's not only about STEM. It's very important that we've got STEM, and this debate is about STEM. But it's got to be a rounded approach. And French is part of it. Anyway, uh, the last thing this government would do is to make it difficult uh, for local authorities to fill the present vacation post in classroom across Scotland, because of course there is a problem of teacher numbers we talked about. Because uh, as for the call of the specialist science teacher in every primary school, to my mind, it's more wish, wishful thinking but an answer. It is ignoring the reality when many local authorities are struggling to recruit primary teachers. Uh, I had, for example, the Peterhead Parent Council members who were concerned about attracting teachers to the Blue Tune, and they told me, I, what I said to them, I said, we are looking to widen the recruitment pool, not to reduce it. And that's important. And another message that this Smith could maybe take to the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition at Westminster is to act regarding uh, the foreign students who are studying here in Scotland and how we can make sure we retain them and we retain all these people to work here in Scotland. And why not to teach? Because it's very, very important that we widen uh, our, our net as much as possible. Aberdeenshire Council, for example, a few years past, had uh, recruited in Ireland, had recruited in Canada, and I think this is very important to make sure we widen the net as much as possible. Uh, we don't want to stop uh, foreign student working here, presenting officer, and this is very important. I don't want to go back in my country. Uh, we never know with the, uh, uh, the proposed uh, referendum uh, to take this country out of the EU. I might be in that position uh, in a few years' time. But today's reality is, is that, despite the backdrop of cuts from Westminster, the this Scottish Government is investing in science and education, providing 900,000 per annum to the Scottish School Education Research Centre to support the professional learning of teachers. Come and to close, this, please. This, this is important because uh, we are investing a lot in, in, in Scotland and in the north east of Scotland. Uh, uh, this Scottish Government is moving forwards. Local authorities are playing their part and we are, as a Parliament, must support the great work of our teachers teaching in the classroom here in Scotland. Thank you. Colleen McCarthy to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I do welcome this debate. As uh, Stuart Maxwell rightly pointed out, it is an issue uh, that has um, occupied the time of the committee, Education Committee in recent times, and I, I certainly acknowledge um, Liz Smith's track record uh, on this issue, and indeed Ian Gray's. In fact, um, to date, I was reminded of, of a comment Ian Gray made in the attainment debate last week, where he accused of us, uh, uh, us of violently agreeing, and I think we are at risk of doing something similar uh, here this afternoon. I am certainly not going to accuse the government of doing nothing, but perhaps focus on areas where we probably need to do more or do better in light of the figures that Liz Smith uh, cited and the evidence produced by uh, various academic bodies in recent times. Let me start with the Learned Societies report produced, published uh, around the time of the Science in the Parliament event last year. It raised serious concerns about spending on science in primary and secondary schools, uh, an insufficiency of teaching expertise uh, and an absence of data 
And it wasn't just a whinge, um, it made some reasonable and I think fairly achievable recommendations uh, alongside this. And in some senses, I think the government's response to that was rather disappointing, because rather than engaging with the issues, it sought to discredit the, the, the evidence, talking about small sample sizes. Uh, rather than uh, perhaps undertake or commit um, to uh, amplify that survey and get uh, the data, provide uh, the evidence, collect it on a, on a regional basis, uh, on a whole host of uh, areas, not least qualifications uh, of teachers, commit to ensuring that by 2020, every primary school has access uh, to a science subject uh, leader. Look again at training uh, and CPD opportunities to improve skill levels. As I say, all reasonable asks uh, from the learned societies. On vocational education, the, the focus of my amendment and picked up uh, very much in, in Ian Gray's, uh, the Wood Commission again made a series, I think, of very sensible recommendations. Uh, the delivery of industry-recognised qualifications alongside academic qualifications during the senior phase was seen as critically important. I, th I think a point uh, Malcolm Chisholm made in, in referring to the college sector. Sir Ian Wood emphasised the need not just to widen availability to but improve the quality of what is provided uh, and concluded that STEM must be at the heart of the development of our young workforce. Uh, let me turn finally to the area of women in STEM, uh, STEM which uh, is uh, referred to in the Tory motion and uh, plays uh, a prominent part in the NUS briefing uh, for this afternoon's debate. The Tapping the Talents report um, produced in June 2012, I think, set out a fairly uh, stark reminder of the challenge we, uh, we face. The RSC have pointed out that the number of STEM graduates and postgraduates have, uh, have increased, but the numbers who proceed to take up senior positions in universities, research, business and industry remain proportionately much smaller uh, than in the case of their mere uh, counterparts. Now, the Minister, in his opening remarks, did acknowledge that, and I welcome it. Um, the RSE talk about wasted investment and the representation of a serious loss of potential uh, for Scotland. I think it's uh, calculated to be around £2 billion uh, wasted to the UK economy as a whole. This is not a new challenge, uh, but it de demands a response from the public, private and the third sectors. One of the recommendations in the Tapping All Our Talents report is in relation to Athena Swan, and it says the Scottish Government, through the Scottish Funding Council, should expect universities to develop a strategy within a two-year period to bring all their STEM departments up to a Athena Swan Silver Award or equivalent, monitor their progress in achieving this, and ensure there is adequate funding uh, for the programme to be developed. The Deputy First Minister, Nicola, Sturge, at, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, at the time welcomed and accepted the recommendations. Almost three years on, it would be interesting to know from the Minister what progress has been made in this regard. You must draw to In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, Sir John R. Buthnot says, to be a smart economy, we need to be strong in STEM. That's why this issue matters. It's why we're violently agreed in our shared ambition, uh, but also why the shortcomings identified by various academic and learning bodies must be addressed as a matter of urgency. Thank, Thank you. you. George Adams, be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the fact that we all recognise the importance of science education, how it can equip our young people with knowledge and skills to contribute to society, and as Liz Smith has already said, to our economy. But improving science, technology, engineering, mathematics education is a key priority of the Curriculum for Excellence, enabling new and exciting opportunities to make schools, science education, stimulating and exciting to all pupils. And this, presiding officer, brings me to a discussion I had towards the end of last year with the head of engineering technology uh, school in the University of the West of Scotland. As many will know, that UWS is actually was a, uh, the campus in Paisley was a technical college, and engineering is the very heart and soul of the university, or it should be at least anyway. And uh, he actually mentioned uh, during the discussion that uh, the problem they had was encouraging people once they explained the career path, once they explained how the, the young people could uh, move on in life with the potential, then it wasn't so difficult to recruit. So they had to find different ways to recruit and interest young people into. Uh, engineering in particular and technology and that was something as well that came up during the uh, evidence we got uh, recently from the Learning Societies group where they mentioned computer science at one point but the problem with computer science was there wasn't many young people wanting to actually teach computer science but there were 
they were getting in a car uh, or a bus or a train to Dundee to make the next computer game so that they could be in that industry. And I think that is probably part of the issue that we're dealing with here as well, is how can we make this uh, interesting that uh, these, these same young people want to actually uh, teach as a future. So what we're seeing with some of the, uh, the evidence that came from the, the Learned Societies group, you know, the, the, we had the situation where the report that they did last year, it was only a small uh, percentage, it was only 2% of Scottish primaries and 13% of secondaries that were involved. But this is important to bring it up because, because they were the Learned Societies group coming from a scientific background, they knew that their report wasn't evidence-based to the extent that they could confidently say everything was right. So I think the government is quite right to bring up the fact that there was... Unfortunately, I don't have as much time, Mr. I would love to, Mr. MacArthur, but I can't at this stage. So in their evidence, uh, they actually said as well, Stuart Farmer said of the Learned Societies Group, the basic knowledge in science subjects I think is taught well. Lots of people are seeing positive benefits for studying science. And I think uh, one of the things that agrees is how do we get to where we want to be? Because we need to ensure that uh, young people are aware of the potential future that they could have uh, for young men and women in this as well. And the Cabinet Secretary, it's been mentioned already, but she brought up the fact that there wasn't such a thing as a girl's or a boy's job. And I think we have to make sure that we move away from that when we're talking about STEM subjects as well, because it's important that we get everyone from all types of backgrounds as well. But in the case, uh, one of the... Uh, briefings that we received for this debate was from NUS and my colleague Christian Allard already mentioned that NUS Scotland said we have seen a strong focus on welcome action and widening access in the last few years and the current drive to improve participation and attainment across Scottish education is welcome. However, we must build on this, not only for STEM, but more generally for, for post-16 education as a whole. I think, for me, the debate we had last week in attainment, this, for me, is a real life-changing debate we have. We have a situation now where the Scottish Government has committed themselves to the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the Attainment Fund, where they're going to be investing in people from uh, uh, difficult backgrounds to ensure that they get that opportunity. And I think, when we're having this debate, yes, let's make sure, like NUS Scotland say, let's make sure that we're talking about the same subjects, but let's not forget about everything else that's happening out there in education and ensure that we encourage everyone to be all they can and pursue whatever career they want in the future. Many thanks. Before I call Elaine Murray, can I apologise to Richard Lyle? I'm afraid we've run out of time and I can't call him. Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the Conservative Party for bringing this important subject back to the Chamber. We talk a lot about Scotland competing globally through developing a high-skill, high-wage workforce. However, unless we invest adequately in developing that highly skilled workforce, it will not happen. Uh, Ian Gray has spoken about the review conducted by the Institute of Physics. Ian often has a dig at me for being a physical chemist. So I would say to him that a report by the Chemical Sciences Scotland uh, on the Skills Investment Plan in October last year stated that almost 80,000 people were employed as a result of the chemicals sciences sector, a turnover estimated to be about £8.6 billion and a GVA of £1.1 billion. But that report uh, identified the, the need to increase the flow of new entrants into the chemical sciences, including through developing career information and also addressing gender imbalance. Our global uh, competitors understand the importance of investing in science and innovation. China intends to spend 2.5% of its GDP on research by 2020, Brazil the same by 2022, and South Korea 5% by 2022. And we can be certain that those countries will be investing in producing the people who can undertake that research. We know from the 2012 programme for international student assessment uh, of school students aged 15 that the UK does perform slightly better uh, than the OECD average in science. England actually prefers, performs slightly better than Scotland, but we are behind China, Japan, South Korea, Finland, Poland, Germany and other competitors. So there is nothing to be complacent about. We need to do better in Scotland and we need to improve educational attainment in schools to attract more students at college and university level into science courses and to retain workers with science qualifications. And we need to also close, close the attainment gap because far too many children from poorer families are not getting the opportunities to fulfil their potential. And that cannot be done without enthusiastic, suitably qualified teachers in both primary and secondary schools. Primary school teachers are expected to teach across the, the, the curriculum and should have access to a science specialist to increase their confidence about how they approach teaching science. I don't think it is necessary for every school to have a science specialist attached only to that school. Small schools could have access to science specialists through cluster arrangements, for example. 
In, three year, in April, it will be three years since the report to which Liam MacArthur referred, uh, referred from Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell's working group on women in STEM was published by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. That report contained a number of recommendations, including some for the Scottish Government. For example, to produce an action plan for Scotland aimed at retaining and promoting women in STEM, which they said should be led by a Cabinet Secretary. And I would be grateful if the Minister, in summing up, could advise whether this piece of work is underway and when the action plan will be produced. The report also proposed that all STEM departments in Scottish universities should achieve Athena Swan Silver Award or equivalent as a minimum standard within two years, and the majority of departments should do so within three to five years. And I wonder, is the government monitoring progress on this recommendation? And nearly three years on, has the minimum standard for all STEM departments in Scottish uni universities now been achieved. Presiding officer, I've stated in this chamber before that I left academic scientific research shortly before my second child was born. She is now 27 years of age and I am shocked that a generation later women are still leaving STEM subjects for the same reasons as I left and that we are still debating attracting and retaining women in STEM subjects. Unless we act in Scotland, and the fact, unless we act across the UK, we will lag behind our competitors in science and this is an area in which we have historically had a huge advantage. We risk losing that advantage unless we take action. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches. And I call in Mark Griffin. Four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. We've heard a lot about the provision of STEM education and schools this afternoon. But for me, the key point uh, was the one made in the, the opening speech by Liz Smith, which is the expectation that by 2030, over 7 million jobs in the UK will depend on, on science skills. Those science roles are exactly uh, what we need, high quality, high skilled and highly paid jobs. By 2030, the four and five year olds who are starting primary school this summer will already be in work or possibly in the final years of university. And if current spending levels continue, the same, pu same pupils with the same academic ability and the same aptitude for science in England will have enjoyed over 10 years of state education with 80% more in primary school and 27% more in secondary school spent on science equipment, according to the recently published report from the Learner Societies Group. We've heard um, the, science, the, the sample size um, of that study raised again, but I think if the government want to criticise the findings of that, then they have an obligation to expand on on that work and do some investigation of their own. Um, well, that issue of science equipment has already been raised in Parliament, there's also the issue of science technicians and support staff. I've recently submitted an FOI request to all 32 local authorities on science technician numbers and have received 25 responses so far. There's been an overall drop in the numbers of science technicians with one authority cutting technician staff by over 50%. Now, those are the staff who are um, maintaining or repairing what little practical science equipment we actually have in our schools. And they're the people who are setting up the science labs, the complex experiments that teaching ha staff just don't have time for. And it's hard to see those numbers go anywhere but further down as budget cuts to local authorities continue to bite. There are also issues in schools and local authorities when it comes to computer science, which were flagged up to the Education Committee um, recently. Um, many high schools don't have a computing science teacher who can start developing the coders, programmers and software developers of the future. And a particular issue in some local authorities is that they seem to confuse the role of teaching of computer literacy skills with computer science skills. And that's, again, mixing up uh, the picture of exactly how many computer science teachers we have in our, in our schools. Finally, there is the, the issue of edu educational inequality. And there will be seven million jobs dependent on science skills in the UK by 2030. But unless that attainment gap is tackled, then there are thousands of young people in deprived communities who will never achieve their full potential to access those jobs. 
We have welcomed the Scottish Attainment Fund, but we would like to, to see more. We would use the additional revenues from a new 50p top rate of tax, redistributing resources from those who can afford it to those who need it most. We would invest an additional £25 million per year, over and above the Government's proposals, to tackle educational disadvantage and ensure the pupils who face the greatest educational challenges have the opportunity to achieve the qualifications they need for a career in science, maths, engineering and technology. And I would challenge the Government to back our ambition and support us with that increased fund to tackle educational attainment. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Dr Alistair Allen, Minister. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At this point, it is traditional to say that it has been a positive debate, and I think to a large extent uh, that comment is, is justified. It has been a useful debate. Uh, there are areas on which we agree, and uh, I suspect uh, that uh, Mr Gray uh, wrote his comments about a tone of sunk, smug satisfaction before listening to the tone of what I and many others actually had to say. Uh, we do agree uh, on many of the areas where uh, work needs to take place, where improvements uh, do need to be made. Uh, I think uh, we've all agreed about the need, for instance, around computing science to encourage uh, more people into that, uh, that, uh, that line of teaching. I think we agree about the importance of the work agenda and developing that further, about giving confidence to primary teachers around dealing with science. And, Perhaps, uh, quite rightly, a, a theme that's occurred again and again uh, is around ensuring uh, that uh, young women are attracted into science as an area of study and as a career. Or, uh, indeed, as Elaine Murray and uh, uh, Mark Griffin have mentioned in this debate, the uh, extent to which we have to ensure uh, that we close the attainment gap for science as for other areas, uh, something uh, to which the First Minister has, of course, uh, indicated her strong commitment. But it's worth also mentioning as well uh, the good practice that there is, and I'll only do this briefly, but the good practice that does exist and that I see in schools when I go around the country uh, and visit uh, science activities there. East Ayrshire, for instance, have opted into the Primary Engineer Programme, which is supported by the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Aberdeen City Council have uh, made science a priority area in their primary schools. Pathfinder activity to deliver foundation apprenticeships in Fife began in August 2014 with support from Skills Development Scotland. So there are many things happening. Um, I think uh, when we turn to the areas that need attention, the, a great deal of uh, speakers, a great number of speakers referred to the, the welcome contribution from uh, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry and others in the, the learned uh, associations, particularly societies, particularly their focus on how we can support primary. Now, we know that STEM in the primary sector uh, is an area which can be further developed, that teachers do need support to help them build their confidence. I've been corresponding with uh, Claire Viney, the Chief Executive of the Royal Society for Chemistry, on these issues, uh, on uh, engaging uh, with uh, their campaign. And my officials are working to agree a suitable meeting date with the RSC. And while uh, I must say we do have no plans to require uh, a move away from the, the generalist tradition that there is uh, within our primary education sector, uh, I am alive to the points that have been made about giving uh, primary teachers the confidence uh, and the, the capacity to teach science. Malcolm, uh, yes, sir. Liam McCarthy. I am very grateful to the Minister for, for taking the intervention and, and I think a constructive uh, approach in relation to the learning societies. One of the, the, the key points, though, was the lack of, of data. And while there are concerns about the survey they undertook, will the government recognise there is a need, therefore, to develop that data so we have a better understanding of exa exactly what the need is and where it is needed? Minister. Well, as, as I've mentioned, uh, that correspondence uh, around these issues is already underway uh, with the learning societies. I, I want to turn briefly to the point that was uh, raised uh, by uh, Christian Allard uh, and others. I don't want to set up any kind of competition um, between uh, the, the, the case for, for languages or the case for science uh, or indeed other areas of our curriculum. But I suppose the fact that members raise these issues does point to the fact that uh, we, we do have to be careful about prescribing the, the, the the hires that people who are interested in becoming a primary teacher take at school to the point where they do not have any choice about what hires they do. So there are competing claims that we have to handle there carefully. 
Uh, Liz Smith made a number of, of reasonable points uh, uh, around uh, uh, many of the issues I've touched on. Uh, we are open as a government to learning from good practice where we see it, whether, as I said, that is in London, whether it's in Ontario. Teach First was mentioned um, by Ms Smith. I want to say um, that Teach First have, uh, uh, have been in contact with the Scottish Government. Uh, we have indicated to them we're very willing to hear from them uh, any proposal they have for Scotland. Uh, subject, of course, to the fact, and I made this point earlier, that Scotland has a tradition uh, very much emphasised by the, the GTCS that you do have to be a qualified teacher to be a teacher in Scotland. Uh, we uh, await uh, any response from uh, Teach First to see if they have a proposal uh, that they wish to bring forward for Scotland. Uh, George Adam, uh, we were having, I have to confess, a sweepstake here. It took 34 seconds to mention his constituency this, this particular occasion, but very commendably so, uh, and rightly mentioned the achievements of the university sector. Uh, and it is, it is worth commenting that the number of entrants into university first degrees in STEM uh, is up 13% this year. Malcolm Chisholm rightly mentioned colleges, and again, the statistics there uh, are encouraging and significant. Uh, the fact that compared with 2006-07, uh, there are 801 more full-time equivalent science and math students in our college sector. I just want to say, by way of conclusion, or do you wish me to continue for some time? No. I do, in no, that case, wish to, I do in that case wish to say, by way of conclusion, I'm happy to say by way of conclusion, uh, that science is at the very heart of Scotland's economy. It's at the heart of our education system. Yes, there are challenges, as I think we have all agreed, but there are sound, verifiable reasons for saying that schools around Scotland share that view, that science is growing in its importance, it's flourishing in our schools, and it's something for us to celebrate. I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mary Scanlon to wind up the debate. Mrs Scanlon, you have until just before 5pm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to close the debate this evening. Uh, and, I, and I would like to thank all speakers for the positive contributions that they've made. Uh, I did feel that there was plenty of heat in the previous debate, and I think it's fair to say that we had perhaps a little bit more light in, uh, in this one. Uh, it, there is, of course, much in the SNP amendment that we agree with, and, uh, uh, but we still feel that more needs to be done to uh, address the, the central issues raised today. Uh, and I did actually feel that in Dr Allen's summing up that uh, he had, there were much more encouraging signs uh, of that than in his opening statement, and we are delighted about that. Uh, but like others, I've listened seriously to the concerns expressed by the STEM industries uh, about the state of science education in Scottish schools. And as Liz Smith said, by 2030, it's expected that there will be 7.1 million jobs in the UK will be science related. And current projections from the Science Council would indicate that around 650,000 of these will be in Scotland. So I think we can all share that we want children in Scotland to get full advantage of all of these opportunities. In Dr Allen's contribution, uh, you know, he s talked about setting targets for teachers. It's not the setting of targets. We hear in the health service and everywhere about the setting of targets. And the setting of tar targets is welcome as a target, but it's the achieving of the targets. It's the supply of teachers that we're looking for. So it's very easy to say, oh, I set a target. I set a target. That's, that's good and it's welcome. But we'd even more welcome the achieving of the targets and an adequate supply of teachers. But in the SEAG report uh, from 2012, the Scottish Government recognised that life sciences and the energy sectors were industries key to economic growth in Scotland. Projections for growth in STEM have also been confirmed by these industries, which is why it's imperative to capitalise on the opportunities this presents for all our young people, and particularly females, to take advantage of this potential uh, for economic growth. Uh, Ian Gray uh, and Liz Smith in particular made excellent contributions, particularly on uh, uh, the STEM education, gender equality and highlighting potential career options for future. And whether or not uh, Ian Gray had members debate recently, I actually think if it's worth saying, 
it's worth saying quite a few times. And I think this issue is so important. We really felt it was worth bringing back to the chamber for the wider debate. We make no apology for that. I would also remind the chamber that female scientists uh, have also excelled in politics. Uh, the UK's first female prime minister, for example, uh, was indeed a scientist. And uh, I, I think there's very few around the European economic community would pick an argument with our, uh, Mrs Merkel, who, of course, used to be a, a research scientist in a previous life, uh, and she's brought to politics absolutely first-class scientific and analytical skills uh, with some considerable success. Uh, Christian Allard reminded us that languages are important, and yes, but the debate was about science, but nonetheless, well done. Uh, uh, learned societies, of course, raised uh, some excellent issues. Uh, and I would also say that Larry Flanagan from the EIS raised his concerns in evidence to the Education Committee, talking about teachers being trained in Scotland and fast-footing down to England. I don't know why. I thank Ian Gray for showing us the new scientists this week. But I do think we need to understand that better. We need to understand why. And I think we need to, to look at what's happening there. Ruth Davidson highlighted the college places in STEM courses down by 30,000. 30,000 reduction in STEM opportunities on the SNP's watch. But never mind, they set a target to redress that. And within what, can you just finish, please? It's quite an important one. Because oh, I'll have to repeat it again. 30,000 reduction in STEM places at colleges on the SNP's watch. But never mind, they set a target to change it. And within one year, they brought back 82 places. So that's... That's what a target means, pretty well nothing, unless it's a few thousand. Give way. Minister. I'm not, not sure if the member heard me, but as I, I, I mentioned the figures for full-time equivalents, which, before she interrupts me on that, full-time equivalents are, are generally regarded uh, within the, the industrial sector as being the most important measure. The increases in the numbers of full-time equivalent uh, students doing science subjects, which there have been under our watch. Well, I don't think you can argue too much about the 30,000 and your little minuscule increase of uh, 82. Uh, I would also remind George Adam that uh, I, I think what uh, on occasions can be a problem for Paisley is sometimes, occasionally, a problem for the rest of Scotland too. So uh, thank you very much, Mr Adam, for that. Uh, but one important point I really wanted to mention, and I think this is... Uh, ab absolutely critical and it's about the uh, maths being the language of science and a fluency in numeracy is absolutely critical for the success of all STEM fields. It is surely unacceptable that we have lost 383 maths teachers as part of the 10% decline since 2007. And talking about numeracy, I think everyone in this chamber should be concerned, or probably are concerned, at the Audit Scotland report, where only 2% of P7 pupils are not working at their expected level of numeracy. Now, perhaps this is within expectations, but what I do find shocking and unacceptable is two years later, in S2, it's not 2% that aren't achieving the numeracy standards. It's 35% are not achieving expected levels of numeracy. So what happens between primary seven, where 2% don't achieve their numeracy standards, two years later, 35% don't. And I would have actually had more respect for the government if they'd come to the chamber to say, these are the issues that we're addressing that have not been highlighted by political parties. These are issues that have been highlighted by Audit Scotland. The point that Liz Smith also made about teachers uh, is very relevant, um, particularly where there are shortages. And there are hot spots, if you, the Minister mentioned. There are unique areas. 
And one unique area is in Murray. Murray Council have done everything possible to advertise for teachers. Yep. They have also had to close schools and send children home. My grand granddaughter is being educated at Mastodloch Primary there. But we also have 11 teachers who are spouses of personnel at RAF Lossiemouth. These 11 teachers were qualified in the English system and surely to goodness in this unique situation something could be done by the GTC and the government working together to ensure that every child in Murray does get the opportunities that they deserve. You need to close, Ms Scanlon. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. But can I just finally say that I think all of the Chamber, despite all the issues we've raised today, I think I would just like to put on record the absolute excellent work done by teachers across, sub across Scotland and in every subject, from science to languages and also in Paisley. And can I just say that we value... We value each and every one of them, Paisley and the whole of the rest of Scotland. And I'll finish there. Thank you, Ms Scanlon. That concludes the debate on STEM Education Scottish Schools. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12406 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12406. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12406, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12407, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12407. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12407, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now come to decision time. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate on an energy strategy for Scotland, if the amendment in the name of Fergus Ewing is agreed, the amendment in the name of Lewis Macdonald falls. The first question is amendment number 12395.1 in the name of Fergus Ewing, which seeks to amend motion number 12395 in the name of Murdo Fraser on an energy strategy for Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12395.1 in the name of Fergus Ewing is as follows. Yes, 61. No, 53. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Lewis Macdonald falls. The next question is amendment number 12395.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey which seeks to amend motion number 12395 in the name of Murdo Fraser on an energy strategy for Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 12395.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey is as follows. Yes, 5. No, 79. There were 30 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12395 in the name of Murdoch Fraser as amended on an energy strategy for Scotland be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12395 in the name of Murdo Fraser as amended is as follows. Yes, 61. No, 53. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. Can I remind members in relation to the debate on STEM education in Scotland, if the amendment in the name of Alistair Allen is agreed, the amendment in the name of Ian Gray falls. The question is... The amendment number 12385.3 in the name of Alistair Allen, which seeks to amend motion number 12385 in the name of Liz Smith on STEM education in Scottish schools, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12385.3 in the name of Alistair Allen is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 51. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Ian Gray falls. The next question is that motion number 12385 in the name of Liz Smith as amended on STEM education in Scottish schools be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12385 in the name of Liz Smith as amended is as follows. Yes, 92. No, 22. There were no abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.